Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Sultans and Sneakers. I'm your host, as always, Mahin the Podcaster. On today's show, I've got Subi Sade in this beautiful home gym. Thanks for, for having me over today. Yeah, welcome, man. Uh, this is a really, a really cool setup. Uh, you know, know go ahead. your lighting is pretty spot on, I think. I didn't know if I needed lighting, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I, I never thought that I'd be recording here, but I'll, although for my podcast, I do record over there sometimes if uh, I need to record early before the, the girls are up. Yeah, I mean, this, like, listen, if every uh, in-person guest gave me like, co- like a cappuccino and an iced Americano... Before I started recording, I think I do a lot more often. You know, what we I mean? honor our guests here. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, this guy's always already got me like a, a take home mug. You know what I mean? But but I want to uh, first of all commend you on your podcast. Um, you know, I remember that was Labor Day weekend last year when we had coffee. Yeah, you remember? And you were you were wanted to talk about you were talking about launching a podcast. And you know, in my head, I'm like, oh no, not another guy who's gonna like talk about launching a podcast and maybe do a pilot episode and quit. That's generally how it rolls, generally for me, right? So I want to commend you on that because you've been extremely consistent. Um, you're at probably 50-some episodes or maybe more now. Yeah, right? I think 55, 54 or 55, yeah. And I've scheduled out a few. I try, I try to schedule out three to four weeks ahead. Um, I remember, the, I don't know if you know, uh, oh man, what is his name? Uh, Pat something. Pat McAfee? Uh, is he like a big podcast? In the NFL. The no, sports no, no, guy. no, 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 no. He, he... Oh, you mean Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn. Yeah. Pat Flynn, exactly. Okay. So I remember one time he was talking about how um, one of the things people need to get off of is the content uh, hamster wheel. Right. Where it's just like, I got to do whatever I can to get... Um, right. Am I, am I good? You're good. You're yeah. Good, yeah. Where it's like, I got to do whatever I can to get an episode out. And it's funny, like, there's a couple episodes uh, early on in, like, the first uh, few months where yeah. it was life got in the way and I had to, like, be up late editing yeah. uh, just to get, because I'm, like, 5 a.m. go live every Wednesday. And so, oh, you're that disciplined. I'm not even yeah. that disciplined. And I've been in the game for six years now. Yeah, so for, for me, it was important to have like a weekly deadline. There's one guy that I uh, talked to who's like an industry person. Okay. And I was telling him about sort of the constraints that I work with in terms of uh, posting, like on a weekly yeah. basis. And he was like, you know, maybe maybe make it like a once a week versus every week on Wednesday at 5 a.m. Yeah. Because then you have a little bit more flex. And I get that, but I think... Um, in any, anything that you're trying to get disciplined early on, yeah, uh, it's really important to have like really, uh, well-defined strict like times for doing stuff. Okay. That's just how I operate. I and you. so, you know, if after a couple years I'm like, whatever, you know, once a week, that's cool. But I think at least, at least for the first six months to year, for me, it's important. Have you, do you even... Do you kind of operate with like tunnel vision where you're not even necessarily, or do you look at your stats for your downloads? No, no. I just recently did actually oh, and really? saw like all the countries and stuff and it's yeah? pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, so you're, you're satisfied with the reach so far, but yeah. you only re- look, well, recently actually, looked at it. Yeah. There was, um, cause my, my podcast is focused on industry, right? right. So, um, it's, it's much more niche. You know, like yeah. if you if you look at if you look at all of the if you look at all all people on the planet, right? right? And you start applying filters like in Excel. Yeah. Like the people that are focused on the area that my podcast sort of specializes in. Yeah. Is like multiple filters down. Mm, right. And so, um, I think LinkedIn also has this because, like I said, mine is more professionally oriented. It's called the Combinate Podcast, by the way. Um, LinkedIn has this uh, tool that like helps you understand what is the what is the total audience like if you were going to capture all of them mm. what would it look like right yeah and i haven't done that exercise cuz honestly for me i don't really i don't want to say i don't care because yeah. i care that people get value out of it but um the reason that i started out to begin with is because i wanted people to talk to me and people wouldn't talk to me so i i created it as a tool for people to start talking to me and then you know, Hamdi, that's, that's a well, well, it's a really great t- resource for, I don't, and I don't think you have to be in the industry. So you and I are, we're in, we're in similar fields, right? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm newer to the game, so to speak. I've been in two years. 
I was telling you the other day when we were setting up this this recording that like I listen to your podcast to get hyped for work <laughs> because it's like it gives you so many ideas and you're like you know there's this whole saying that like um, there's a guy named Mark Horseman from Manager Tools he says oh, yeah, that he says that like in the land of the blind the one eyed man is king mm. you know and I feel like you're because you, you you're not getting like random like low level bums you're getting from and and i've actually had a chance to like meet some of your guests right all right because yeah. i'll reach out to them like honestly they're they're that approachable i'll say hey i heard you, I, i'll ping them on linkedin and um you know one of the guys i remember i had dinner with him and it was just like just picking his brain and the first and he's, he's much younger than me and i was just like but this guy's perspective on career and like how he like navigates things but also knowing where to put career in its place versus like life with life right was was really interesting because you find today that most of my friends I think now it's like I would say most friends I have they treat their jobs like a um just a paycheck mm. right there isn't like this idea of like you know passion and I think that's something we were wanting to talk about is like can passion uh be cultivated Cal Newport talks about this in uh his book uh so good they can't ignore you right um, and I remember when we had first had a conversation about like at, at Starbucks and I was like, why are you so excited about this? And you were like, well, I really enjoy processes, like process flow and, um, and anything, everything is a process, whether you're in finance or manufacturing or like whatever field, I don't know what other fields, like those are the fields I know, you know, uh, medicine even, right? Um, everything's got a process and a lot of times people operate in places where processes are broken, right? And, um, they don't know anything about it. They just, they just go along with it. But I think I think it takes a special person to like say, here's a problem, and now let's let, let let's work towards fixing. I think that's that passion, I think resonated with me like a year ago, and I feel like I've even taken, it's put on a light in my own head with my career, right? Because I, I I think I used to have this mindset where I was gonna like eventually do podcasting full time, but then number one you realize that's really hard. <laughs> you gotta be like like I mean to be able to monetize a, a podcast for like a full time career is a is a huge thing and I'm not saying it sh should be a goal but I think that like I actually enjoy what I do right and I think I've, some of that's been been after listening to your show to be honest oh. and some of the and some some of the content you put out and also some <clears> of the <throat> connections I've made because of your show you're gonna make me blush dude <laughs> you know what I mean yeah. I, it's it's actually it's very gratifying you know when when uh and it's happened before where people are like oh I really enjoyed this episode or I got a perspective that I didn't think about before I mean, also, I feel like at, at companies, it, I don't want to say it becomes, it's not groupthink, but you have a limited pool of, uh, you have a limited pool of experience. Right. And so whenever you have one person who, for example, has significant experience in an area, it ends up being, they're the, you know, they're the only person. And that's sort of the known opinion. There's no other, there's nothing to compare against. And so I think looking outside is what, what's really helpful. And for me, like that, that whole time in my life, right when I met with you, mm. um, you know, I had been in industry for, for about 10 years and I just got an opportunity to work on an industry committee. Okay. And so in, in all industries, right, like you used to be in steel before, right. there's like ISO and ASTM and ANSI and yeah. all these standards, standards bodies are, and, and regulatory bodies. Right. Regulatory bodies are, uh, or in, 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 in certain parts of the world, they call them competent authorities, oh. but they're, they're really, uh, they're, they're part of the government, generally speaking. Right. Standards are, are industry groups that harmonize on what are, what all are, basically what is the state of the art. And sometimes people look at state of the art as this idea that it's like cutting edge, mm -hmm. but if you look at it as, as what it actually is, it's state of the art. It's just what is going on in the art right now. It's the current state. And so anyways, I started working on these industry committees, right? I was working on this kind of, uh, this guidance document that was okay. relatively low level. Right. And the light went off in my head that I could actually influence industry. Like okay. I, I never felt that before. Mm. And uh, that was sort of at the same time where I was like, you know, I want to start talking to more and more people, get more and more exposure and build on the experience that I already have. And, um, 
That's why I met with you. And it's kind of like, also, it helps your brand, right? They talk about brand yeah. building, personal brand building. Um, well, obviously, they say most cut and, most conservative approaches will be like in career, you have to have like, there's two things, um, relationships and results, mm. right? Oh, I like that. He don't, yeah. Well, Mark Horseman talks about this. Like, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's the thing. You have to, you have, to have both, right? And I think for the, um, rela- it's very, your podcast, I think, really helps you in the relationship side. Right, no you're, you're building this network, but I think it also indirectly helps your results because of, you know, what you learn if you apply what you learn in your recordings, um, to to your actual to to your actual craft, so to speak, right? And I think that's the approach that I think people need to take is that like, um, you know, I, I hope to have I have a guest like tentatively um, scheduled. Um, he he he's an alum. Um, but he's also the vice president of a major aerospace company in technology, oh, right? Like he's a, he, he gives fatwa, you know, he, he, like he's, he has to qualify to give actually, if, like to give fatwa, but he has like a real day job that's like really intense. And, um, you know, I was just talking, and I, and I want to talk to him about this idea that like, you know, I, I feel like Muslim guys who are in like careers, um, there's just this like, I would say generally speaking, my impression is that they just don't take it seriously. Hmm. And the the mindset should be if you're well if you're not gonna take it seriously I get it, it's for a paycheck but why don't you go do something that like you take you'll take seriously or do you find something and I think that's what I've learned is that you, um, you if you start putting your heart into it the passion will develop in hmm. a sense right um, going back to your undergrad years you had mentioned to me before and I'm, if I say too much that you don't want me to say, let me know. I'll cut it out. But like, you told me you weren't necessarily the best student. Oh, I, I, I'm, I still don't think I'm a good student. Okay. Yeah. But like, you did? Were you like you went to you went for biomedical engineering as your undergraduate? Yeah. Um, like, did you like enjoy the classes or was no? It... No, I didn't at all. Okay. Actually, I I started out um. I started out chemi. Okay. Um, because my dad Allah Hamo, he was chemi. Uh huh. Um, he, he did his, he did his bachelor's at, uh, UIC and his master's at IIT. Um, and, and did did your father work in industry? Very briefly. So he, was he more in like the research labs? It was like, I I don't even know actually. Okay. All all the, I mean, when, when I was alive, he was all, all, you know, doing his own businesses and stuff. Oh, not even related to engineering. Oh, nothing, nothing related to engineering. Okay. But so, yeah, I started out chemical because of that and I didn't really like it and then I switched to biochemical right I, I actually I made it a con- it's a concentration I did biochemical and then I switched to bio e around sophomore year and it was okay it was it was cool um, I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed all my classes there were a couple standouts like there, there's one of my professors I've had on uh, my podcast there, there were a couple, but I would say 75% of them I didn't. You did not? I did not. Okay. No. And, and on top of it, I wasn't really that good of a student, and I was working for the most part all through college, and so it was kind of like uh, a little bit all over the place. But um, I was, I, you know, I, I sort of operated good enough. You know, I satisfied requirements, essentially. Okay. And then um, I, did, I did do research in college briefly. And then my last year of school, this is, this is where, like, the light bulb went off. Okay. My last year of school, we did our senior design project with Baxter. Okay. And we were given a problem to solve. And a certain, ther- this, they, gave us, they gave us something to work on. Um, and we were able to go visit the, the, the campus up in Round Lake here in North Chicago mm-hmm. at tour the labs. And that's when things started to really click for me in terms of like, okay, this is kind of cool. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing. I can't wait. It was like, okay, well this is, this is definitely going to be more exciting than selling cell phones, which is what I'm currently doing <laughs> now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also at, at that time, like I was, I was freshly married my last year of college and, um, you know, I was also excited, you know, to start getting some bread, you know? Um, and so anyway, so like I, uh, I, I used some of the relationships that I had built. You talked about relationships to, to get into Baxter and yeah, because um, of Baxter, if I remember when I was an undergrad, they were one of those companies that were pretty scrupulous on your GPA. 
Uh, they didn't ask me. They, did, well, they didn't ask you? No. What, and do, I graduated in 07. I feel not, like, that it, not that mine is that bad, but they didn't. Actually, it's funny. Um, one, only one time in my whole career, two times. Uh, one time I applied to Epic, you know, like Epic Systems yeah. up in Madison. They right. do uh, uh, the VHR. software for them for the for the hospitals. Yeah. yeah, this was maybe like one year after I graduated or something like that. Right. And I think they asked for my ACT score, dude. What? Yeah, that's not out of high school. <laughs> yeah, and this is like for a professional job. And then one time I was applying internally for a job at Baxter, and one person asked me my GPA. Your undergrad yeah. GPA. My undergrad GPA. Yeah. How many years were you out of school by then? Less than a year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, was still pretty, it, it was a reasonable, like, ask. Okay. Yeah. But, I, but it's funny, you know, like, now, now that um, there's, there's a guy that I really like named Alex Hormozzi. I don't know if you've heard of I've him. I've heard the name, but only, like, in passing. I don't, like, I haven't consumed any of his content. Yeah. So, so he, what's he about? Explain to me real quick. He has, he has this company called Acquisitions.com, and he's, he's trying to build um, a portfolio of companies that, like, is, a, is worth a billion dollars in value. I think he's over a hundred million now. Yeah. Him and his wife. He started out in gyms, and anyways, now he's helping buy and accelerate companies and things okay. like that. Um, he he seems to me to be super legit. I, I have one of his books, and um, I really like because like there there's there's a when when you um, consume someone's con content and and you can tell like. They're talking about things based on experience, mm -hmm. not like uh, pseudo knowledge. Yep, that's what I find really important. So, anyways, he talks about, and, and and I knew this before a little bit from sales, like the the importance of the the best way to 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 win at deals is to just have more leverage. It's not you're, you're not going to sweet talk your way. It's like just understand what the leverage points are and have more leverage, right? The reason that I bring that up. Is because I was in my the, the, this guy that asked me my GPA. Looking back now, at how I used to operate, I used to be like the over prepared kind of try hard interviewee, like uh, because I had no leverage. You know what I mean? Okay. And so I would go in guns blazing, you know. And so in this interview, I didn't get the job, but I went in. The reason that I say that is. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll back I'll backpedal a little bit. I went in and I had for each person that was interviewing me a folder of like the portfolio of experience that I had. Yeah. I printed on uh, printed resumes on resume paper because it was an internal job flash drive with like, you know, some of the work that I've done for each person, you know, it was mm -hmm. kind of like thirsty. And so uh, having gone through that experience, it's like off-putting and now I'm um, much more chill. You think it's off-putting? You don't think it, 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 it speaks to preparedness or seriousness okay, okay. about the so, interview? Okay, so, so um, it, it doesn't come, it, for me, it doesn't come to preparedness. I'll tell you why. Because okay. if, if I were to come to you and tell you, hey, Mahin, um, you know, you're this type of company and I know having been, having worked here that for the last year that you guys are struggling with A, B, and C. Oh. Here's some examples of how I've worked on those things that you can take a look at. And here's a couple of ideas that I think would help your group because I've interacted with them and I've interviewed some of them in preparation for the interview, right? right. That's not try hard, that's prepared. Okay. Um, when you're just blasting somebody who never asked you for something, that's when it's try hard. Okay. You know, I did, uh, you know the, the, what I was providing wasn't solving a problem. Uh -huh. It was an add-on to their to-do list. Let me review this person's work. Not, let me see what this person is saying about how they can solve my problem. Okay. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, I even heard this a couple days ago. Do you know who Chris Voss is? Yes. Yeah. So The negotiation was, guy. The negotiation guy. Yeah. And so he was talking about how he hired, he, he was interviewing this HR consultant to do something for his company. And this guy was going on and on and on. And he was like, you know, I've worked with companies with 5,000 employees. I've worked with companies with three employees. And I'm talking about all the breadth of experience that he's, he's worked on. And he's like, but you, as the person who's trying to sell me, you know my company is five people. Why would I care about how many 5,000 company, how, how 5,000 person companies you've worked on? It's irrelevant. 
right? Exactly. Yeah. It's orders of magnitude different in terms of like what you what you do. I would think. Right. Um, no, that, that, that's a, that's an interesting point of view. Um, you know, so then you, you, that that kind of light bulb went off, you, and you and you went on. You, you mentioned you you worked at Baxter for a few years, and then you and now you've moved on and whatnot. Um, yeah. You know, what's the, um, do you have an end goal as far as career goes? Do you, is that a position or you talk about influencing industry? Do you just want to be seen like when you're, do you think about things like legacy? No, no, actually it's funny. You know, do, uh, have you ever heard of the podcast philosophy? There's like too many references, but have you heard of philosophize this? No. So he did an episode on this guy named Ernest Becker. And okay. he was saying that whether, whether you're secular or religious, mm -hmm. like the people that, the people that are focused on legacy are no different than the people that are focused on God, essentially. That they're looking for some, some whether, whether you're leaving behind or going to yeah, it, right. you know, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. But for me personally, I don't, really, I don't really think about that because I actually, I was driving into downtown a couple days ago. And I was like, man, subhanAllah, there's so many people here. You know, there's millions of people in, in Chicago city limits. Right. And none of them are going to be here in 150 years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so in terms of legacy, I don't really think about it like that. I think about it more in terms of helping people and uh, talents. Like I heard a lecture once where the guy was talking about the story of Sayyidina Dawood. And he was like, it's a peculiar dua to ask God to have the biggest kingdom, right? It's kind of like uh, not humble. Sure. You know, like how are you going to ask to have the, the most, uh, the widest kingdom in like a temporal world, mm -hmm. you know? And the takeaway though, the lesson was he knew that his talent was leading. That, and so he wanted to apply his talent in the biggest playing field that mm -hmm. he could find. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way that I look at it. For me, like I started out in, in R&D, definitely not cut out for it. Then I started, then I moved to manufacturing and it was like a little bit better. I started getting kind of like B pluses on my work and then I moved into quality and it was just like, this is it, you know? And so I, I don't really look, I don't really look at, I don't look at anything in terms of angle. Mm -hmm. I look at it like it's a direction kind of thing. Interesting. Now, when you mentioned to me about quality before, it was like you enjoy the process side of things, right? Yeah. But manufacturing is also very, well, R&D has process as well, right? Um, I, you know me, I'm, I guess I am more suited for manufacturing, but there's a lot of headaches in manufacturing. Yeah. Right? I think you're so, like, we live in, a, they, they, you know, they talk about um, this, you know, in America, that so much of our manufacturing got outsourced, right? Um, it's globalization. It's hard to find good talent. You need a lot of bodies or competent to manufacture well, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you need a culture of accountability to mm -hmm. hold people accountable to like, you know, to manufacture at a standard. Um, was that some of the issues you had with me? Because you said it's a B plus. You liked some of it because it's probably, it's probably cool to see the product being made. Yeah. But was it the way of, did you see it was like it, that we're almost crippled in a way or we're, we're handcuffed? From doing certain things or what, what was your issue uh like i, I want to understand a little bit about like you know this is being a b plus versus this being an a uh i would i wouldn't say um b plus is still acceptable right and so not if you're daisy yeah that's or out of i guess too, <laughs> yeah. but I, my, my point with that was to say that like i was doing okay work yeah but i it wasn't exceptional it wasn't like uh Man, I'm trying to think of a saying. There, there's a saying that goes, um, the takeaway basically, essentially boiled down, is instead of instead of fi instead of doing what you're passionate about, find what you're most suited for. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that that's what I mean when I say that it wasn't I I wasn't bad, but I wasn't it wasn't something that I felt like I could be exceptional at. It wasn't something that I felt like I could be world class at at some point in my life okay. if, if I pursued it. Um, though, though I think anything really, but it's like, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, Cause your natural talent didn't necessarily fit it fully. Exactly. Exactly. Like R and D complete, not, 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 not a match. Not. Right? Definitely not. You know, manufacturing was like, okay, closer. But when I got into quality, it just, um, 
I'd have to, I don't know. I have to think about what, what it is about it that I love. I mean, I, there are a lot of things about it that I love, but I don't know what about it is so... Do you, do you, do you like Kappa? <laughs> I like the idea of Kappa. And, and because... because Kappa like, Kappa, is, by the way, for those who are... Yeah. We're, we're like nerding out here, but Kappa yeah. is like corrective action when there's a problem, like a, what he calls a nonconformance. Yeah. And a nonconformance is pretty much, generally speaking, any deviation from your normal procedure or process, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, so... Because every, cause everyone hates Kappa. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny, you know, there, there's one person that I talked to. Now he's, now he's a senior director. Uh, he manages compl- the, like the complaint handling unit at yeah. a big company. Right. And this guy's like a bona fide scientist. Patents, a bunch of patents, PhD, worked in R&D for a really long time. Right. And I was just like, what are you doing with complaints? You know, that's in, in quality. Many people get their start handling complaints. And this person's not like doing intake triage. And it's like kind of complaints, like field complaints. You put a product in and your customer has a complaint about something. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, you know, let's say, let's say you're at a hospital. You, 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 you open a box and there should be one and there's two in there. You know, you say, hey, by the way, um, we got this, uh, this product and it wasn't to our expectations. And then you'd ask them to send it back, you do an investigation and so on. So this, this person's not managing you know, individual complaints, he's managing the, the, ton, you know, the, the complaints that are coming in, yeah. right? And so I was like, why did you leave R&D where it seemed like you were doing pretty well? To basically you listen to people bitch. Yeah. That's and, what it seems like, right? Well, I mean, I mean so, so in our industry, right, like complaints are not only, uh, continuous improvement opportunities, but there, they could be issues too. Right. And so, um, you know, he was just like, I found that I started working on the things that people are actually struggling with. And so Kappa, you know, um, you're, if, if they're, if they're done right and prioritized appropriately, you're working on, you yeah. know, what you should be essentially. I think the thing about, I, I see the value in Kappa, like you said, if it's done right, I think you can learn a lot about because when you have to explain to a layperson, yeah, like how your process works. If you're writing a cap like the Kappa, it forces you to like, do you really know it? You know what I mean? You got to go back and re- and like look into it and like, how do I explain this? Does this make sense? Um, but sometimes it's just like you're trying to talk to somebody like, well, that's no, that's actually you're you're missing the point here. That's not how this works, and that, that that's when it becomes I guess frustrating when you have people who don't have SME or subject matter experience. Um, in the in the field you're made right in the cap before and that problem but, but i want to like you know r- wrapping up this whole career podcast segment here um of, the, of this of this of this episode um what is it about like if, if you were going to say give a, a piece of advice to someone who wants to start a podcast number one and then secondly what's the most what's the thing you've probably there's one thing you've taken away from the last year of recording podcast so first question like if someone want, approached like you approached me a little over a year ago if someone approaches you now, but they, I'm sure they have. They yeah, actually. Podcast, how, how, like, what, 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 what advice do you give them? Can I, can I pause on the question and just make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, so I remember when I met with you, 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 were, you were, and we're boys, right? Yeah. Like we, we've, uh, and we have a lot of mutual friends, so like we hang out and stuff. Mm-hmm. But we sat down and, and had coffee and you were just like, you know, I typically charge for this. Yep. Because most of the time that people uh, meet me to talk about podcasts, they just waste my time and they don't end up doing anything with it. And I charge you a cold brew. You charge me a cold <laughs> brew. Yeah, that's right. But but anyways, for for me, that was just like uh, the biggest shake to my spine. Wallahi, like it was it was like a foundational moment for me. Okay. And actually, um, that I have never it. Like, since I heard that, I yeah. never have had the thought, like, I'm just going to not post an episode this week. Wow. Yeah. Because it was just like, yeah, I don't want to be part of the skeletons that, you know, <laughs> never started. It was really, it was really impactful. The podcast graveyard. Yeah, exactly. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're right. Like, people say that there are, I don't know how many hundred thousand podcasts or might be millions. All right. But most of them only have a couple episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I've, I've seen, like, in med tech or biotech um, you know, somebody will post an episode on LinkedIn and I'll be like, oh, I haven't heard of, of that show before. And I'll go and they have like three episodes in two years or something like that. Um, but what, what recommendation I would have, I've told so many people to do it. Like, um, most, most, 
So I'm going to riff on this a little bit. Sure. So I remember when, when, I, when I was in my maybe second or third year in my career, I started traveling for work. I was in manufacturing. And I was traveling with, with a few people. And one of them was, was a, a director in regulatory um, who was much higher up than I was at that point. And another one was, was a senior man, man, uh, manager in manufacturing. And they were just talking about how basically they're unmotivated. And they were. They were. Uh, wow. Okay. And, you know, it was like it was like dinner after after three long days, and yeah, uh, they're kind of they like were venting a little bit. Venting a little bit, and I, I I was just like, actually, I think I if I remember, it, it was a long time ago, but I was talking about how like you know certain people inspire me, right? At work, like this person inspires me. I like how they do this or that, and. The, the this one person was just like I don't have one person at work that inspires me, you know, and and she asked the other person and she's like, do you have uh, somebody at work that inspires you? And and he's like, no. And f- for me, that was just like the saddest. It, it wasn't it wasn't demotivating. Yeah. Because you know I have this I have this kind of like uh, be- it's not really a belief, but like there's. You, you can be convicted in certain things. So like if I feel like I'm motivated by certain things, I don't care if a million people tell me like, you know, that person isn't motivating or whatever. Or if somebody tells me that like this thought isn't going to make sense and it's going to take too long. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to, I'm just going to like discard it. But going back that for me, that, that uh, discussion was, um, motivating in a way because I was like this is the point that I was trying to make with with that whole thing it was like uh if if you guys tell me that there's nobody here that's motivating I don't believe you because I see a bunch of people that I'm motivated by and so I think the problem is you you know I think you're the way that you're looking at it is somebody needs to be like a Nobel Prize winner to be motivating and it's just like that's not that's not how it works. And one of the person, one of the people that I had on my podcast, his name is Chuck Ventura. Okay. Um, he he was he was in 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 like big pharma, big med device, and then moved into his own startup and, and is doing a lot so of work. He's a younger UIC. guy. Uh, more or less. I I don't know. How, I don't know how. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I remember. But, I remember that podcast that episode. Yeah, but one one of the things that he said. Um, and and this is this has been the same thing like in any area of my life is like. I asked him, what do you recommend for people who are graduating college and they want to get their first job? And most people are so caught up in trying to meet VPs and things like that. And it's just like, that person can't help you. That person can't help you with with your career management. They may be able to give you direction, but that person can't help you get, they technically could help you, but they're not going to be the ones that influence helping you get an entry level position. You know yeah. what I mean? They're hiring senior directors, directors, that type of thing. You know what I mean? Um, so all to say, the thing that... He, I, I think people assume that, oh, because of the VP, like we all report to a VP. Yeah. And they could just be like, yeah, yeah that, th- put, p- I want that guy there. Yeah. The entry level job. But that, you're, that just generally doesn't happen because th- they don't want to, most good VPs don't want to override their directs yeah and that that's happened to me before like i wanted to get into a role under one of my mentors right um who i had known for years right and i applied for this role who that was um reporting into one of his reports it wasn't like a few layers down it It was was like one layer apart and you know the guy was just like He's, he's motivated, he's uh, smart, but he just doesn't have the experience that I'm looking for. And so he didn't hire me, you know? Right. <laughs> and then it's like, you know, I, I learned that lesson that, so going back to the Chuck, he said that if you're, if you're graduating, you're about to graduate, make sure that you get really close with the people that are about to graduate. If you're a junior, get tight with the seniors because those are the ones that are gonna tell you, hey, I have an open role and I can talk to my boss. Yeah. After building a rapport for six months or a year, right. right? And so for 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 podcasting, like one, I would say start it. Two, you know, essentially be consistent. You don't need a ton of um, 
equipment like this setup is crazy you know <laughs> like I, I didn't even think about I, I've never thought of and I still don't think there was one guy I talked to um, a, a, Dr. Uh, James Samaro, who has a podcast called the Health Tech Podcast. Right. I was like, dude, you have like 300 episodes or something yeah. like that. Why don't you do video? And he was just like, I haven't thought about it. But for me, I'm pretty, an I, I don't want to say I'm anti, but I almost never watch the video okay. for me. Yeah. Like I never, I've never go on YouTube and look at podcasts. I'm always on Spotify while I'm walking or mm. while I'm doing like dishes or something. That's how I listen. And mm. Yeah. So I yep. think, um, and you with your niche, I think there's an understanding that your audience is going to be savvy enough to listen to a podcast app, right? Um, unfortunately, with like a Muslim audience, um, <laughs> they will like listen on YouTube, and I'm like, why would you um, listen on YouTube when the app is so much easier? And you're like, no, it's easier for me. I got premium. It skips all the ads. I'm like, okay, so so most they say most people have premium. And I was like, I tried pre premium is great, by the way. I really? tried it once for a month, but I'm like, it's also not twelve bucks a month great. Okay. Like if you it just starts adding up, right? And I was like, okay, because it cuts through all the ads, it'll like you can turn the app off, it'll still keep playing. You know, so there's a lot of content out there. Sometimes what happens is like I might release a pod so there's some content that I have on the app, on the podcast app that's not on YouTube. Mm. Only because the video was such a nightmare to edit, and I haven't gotten. I, I've got stuff in the backlog, three years old. Like, really? <laughs> yeah, like videos. Interesting. That I haven't gotten around, and I'm like thirty pounds heavier. Well, not really thirty pounds heavier, but you can see I'm like a lot chunkier. Yeah, you lean scale down. wise, I'm not as you know. The people will see that video, like, wait a second, did you get all your weight back? Because I just released it, but um, That's so there's funny. there's a few I have to like. I at some point I will get around, maybe editing it right but it's but it's but video editing is so much more time consuming than audio so i so i so I, I like your idea because your niche doesn't require video yeah so that so it would it essentially would be to start yeah and I, for me i think like the the pressure right and we see this with with some uh scholars where it's yeah. like you know for you to do certain things you need to have certain qualifications yeah. right like you shouldn't go and do for example to see it if you haven't done x y and z right fine yeah, yeah. i'm with that um but sometimes there's a self-imposed kind of resistance mm -hmm. around doing things and it's just because you're putting something out there that people can see mm -hmm. and that just kind of gets easier gotcha can um, you sp okay go ahead i was just gonna say to, yeah. to your to your second thing yeah you know the the thing that i've learned the most is how, one how approachable people are mm -hmm. um and so, you know, like to that, going back to that lady's point, every episode just kind of validates how um, there are so many people to be motivated by. And that like, um, that, you know, I see this all the time, like nobody has it figured out and that type of thing. And that's true for yeah. like, nobody really ever has anything figured out right. fully. Yeah. Or I should say life figured out fully. Yeah. Um, but, but man, when you meet somebody who has figured it out, or somebody who's like, there's a there's a really good book called uh, Good to Great, very famous book, right. and they use the metaphor of a flywheel, right? Yeah. And so, like, if you if you see somebody who's removed all the gunk and all the resistance out of their flywheel, yeah. and they've just been going for thirty years, yeah, and you see how prolific someone can be, yeah, if they just have, you know. Yeah, all, all, to all, say, all, all the waste all, removed. Yeah, all the all the waste removed. Like, there are a couple of interviews where I was just like, I thought I was here, yeah, but I'm not. Yeah, and and I thought that there was only this much gap to understand, right? But the gap is way bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, and it and and it ends up feeding itself, eventually. Right. You know, and I think that's when you resonate with. Like yeah, so and and I and I think sometimes people have the wrong mindset. You like you alluded to that it's got to be a VP or senior director or you know managing part whatever industry you're in. But like I mean, since since you're dropping guest names on your podcast, obviously my all time favorite episode is Rick Doe. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> and he was your sec was your second guest or first guest? He was, he like was my second recording, first post. Okay. Yeah. Was it okay? Was Larry Mager your first one? Yeah. Okay. He, he's he's one of my favorites. Yeah. You know? I mean, he, that, that guy. 
but nice quality. the thing about Rick Doe was that uh, Rick's energy that just it, it came through the speakers. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's why I was like, I had I I, I remember I pinged him on LinkedIn and we had dinner. Like I mentioned, I mentioned them your guests, and I think that that was just from a I think Rick from a mindset point of view was just like I was just blown away. I was like, where, where does this dude learn? This dude is this dude is from like the country in South Carolina. I and mean, he got an MIT, I think he too was telling me. Like, he got accepted. He didn't go because he was able to go to, like, I guess, U- University of South Carolina. Yeah. You know, the financial package was so great. But I just think, like, talking to – I was just like – and I, when I met him in person, I was like, this dude is legit. Like, I mean, I need, like – I need, like, whatever he's got, I need, like, inject that in my veins, like, right now. <laughs> you know, but even the other – and the other guest that I really that I really uh, that I had a chance to, was, was David Simmons. Yeah. Right. Being a non-engineer, because sometimes people will like say, "Oh, I don't have this degree," and it'll let them pull them back. I'm like, this dude knows engineering concepts better than me, and I'm an engineer, right? And he's younger than me, right? Because he was talking about how he went about how he learned. I was like, you know, the way he like he was he was talking about this. There's a process called freeze drying, and I'm, we're again, you know, lyophilization and. You know, he's talking about how he, like, learned the process. And the way he learned it was, I remember back when I was an in, a younger engineer working in the utilities department at the steel industry, that's how they would teach it. Like, the senior guys who were, like, operating technicians or, like, you know, who came out and worked out right of high school, but they knew the place inside out. They'd be like, yeah, you have to follow this nitrogen line all the way. And sometimes you don't know if it's, ni- even if it's nitrogen or not because it's unlabeled. You have to, like, verify. And that's what he was doing. I was like, man, this guy did it the old school way. Right, but he did it at such a young age. So I was like, that's the kind of thing that people can resonate with. I and finally, um, your podcast I don't think is just for biotech, in my opinion. Um, I listen to a podcast called Flipping the Barrel, it's an oil and gas yeah, podcast. Yeah. Right? There's these these two women, they they run this show. And it's really engaging and they talk to industry leaders in oil and gas. But a lot of the skills are super transferable. You just gotta think about it that way. I think people have to get out of this mindset that like it has to be tailor made for what I mean or my situation right now. Like, no, just open up your, like, use your brain and open it up. You know what I mean? So, um, finally, on this topic, uh, a career before we shift a little bit into, like, fitness, um, talk to me a little, you mentioned mentorship, and I, and I just, it just popped in my head, I wanted to ask you about it. Um, how should we approach mentors? Because it's something I'm struggling with personally, okay? Mm. Um, you know, my company, we have, like, a corporate mentorship program. Uh, my first mentor um, was in commercial. Um, my previous mentor, I, I had a long time mentor at my last company in the steel industry and he was in commercial because I, my goal was always to go, go into commercial, right? When I joined like the pharma, bio, med, you know, healthcare industry, I figured like, let me start with the commercial guy as well. I wanted somebody outside of engineering, which is my, or manufacturing engineering, which is at my scope. So I was like, this guy can help me understand like his big picture stuff. And then I had, and so I did him for a year. <coughs> him for a year. Um, I, I our mentorship program expires after a year. You have an option to renew. And I told him, like, without, you know, I enjoyed his relationship. He, he got transferred to Asia. So I um, picked up a new mentor in regulatory, right, mm-hmm. uh, while maintaining the old relationship because I figured I can just add on. But I'm just not sure when I meet with my mentors that I'm getting, like, like am I getting value out of it? You know what I'm saying? Um, because my regulatory mentorship just expired, I could like probably renew if I want to. I'm guessing probably not. I mean, he's someone that I'll probably stay in touch with. Um, but I guess, w- do you uh, like? I, I guess I, I, I'm just really unclear about how to like um, manage that relationship and how to uh, make it fruitful for for myself. Because I don't know that I'm because because a lot of times they don't know my field that well. And they'll give super generic advice, mm. and it's hard to like you know implement that. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, I, I guess it's 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 the same way that I approach like my podcast. Like when when I when I think of a question that I have, yeah. I look at who can answer it, and yeah. I just sort of ask. And the you know I think a lot of people kind of look at it like a guru. Uh, what what is the, it's not disciple right like guru, no but like to like, so if we had the sheikh and the murid relationship murid, yeah yeah I, I don't really I mean yeah that that is a relationship I actually I remember I went to um, like this all day seminar on Tazkia with uh, Sheikh Hussein Abdul Sattar mm-hmm. and and it was really really good and it talked about how or I should say he he talked about 
uh, this is my this is my interpretation of what he said, by the sure. way, not what he said. Um, but that the that part of part of that relationship is just helping you contextualize yourself as a student. Mm -hmm. That you just being under a teacher yeah. helps you be in a position so that you can learn, right, right, or take from someone. And so, you know, you have to sort of be careful from from who you take. But I think like in terms of mentorship. What is a question who can answer it? And it's not like a will you be my mentor matchmaking thing. It's more like, you know, I know a person that might be able to answer this question and I'm going to ping them and ask them or I'm going to call them and, and ask them. And then one question becomes two and two becomes three and then three becomes lunch and so on. Yeah. You know, it just it sort of builds on itself. But I don't think all, all the all the folks that like. I've gone to that have given me significant advice. It's only been after a long time and high reps of them sort of understanding how I operate. It's kind of like uh, the, sh the shallower the relationship, the shallower the advice. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, it, in, terms of, in terms of approaching people, like title matters less as much as skill set. Like mm -hmm. I have... A, a quote of walls and one of my favorite ones mm. is by a guy named James Clear mm -hmm. you know like he wrote Atomic, Atomic Habits. Habits yeah but I, he had a blog before and so I was fanboying way before his book came out for years yeah uh, one of his things is competence do you, do you have his minimalist tra travel uh, pack no what is that it's basically like this one backpack these pair of pants I forgot what the brand is um, he wears these he basically packs everything in a backpack for like a two week trip I've, I've done that before. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I, uh, I didn't know he has a backpack. I recently bought a backpack on Amazon mm -hmm. called the Tom Talk, okay. and it's spectacular, dude. Really? I, I had been, uh, do you know Chrome? Like the Chrome yeah. bags? Yeah. So I had a Chrome Barrage, I think it's called. Okay. Sick backpack. Yeah. Uh, for, and I've had it for, I don't know, seven, eight years, because right. I used to bike around in Chicago and stuff. And it's just a big bag like it's just a big pocket you really you know yeah and it just it wasn't it wasn't conducive for traveling or anything like mm -hmm. so i bought a new backpack it's pretty pretty sick but i'll, I'll look into uh i've actually thought about getting into backpacks a little bit it, it's like another if you're into like the men's like fashion stuff bags are now accessories are they really yeah well you there's tote bags so, so you see everybody is your hat west side barbell yeah it is that's cool. I just noticed. You can it. tell. Yeah, it's like Nitro, the the dog, the dog deadlifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a West because that's my oh, hometown. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say Columbus. It's fifteen minutes from my parents' house. Have you gone? I've I've actually met Tom Barry, who's the um, who runs West Side right now. He was Louis yeah. Simmons' uh, second in command. Dang. But I didn't know it was Tom Barry when I met him. Really? Right. So it's funny because I. But did, um, but did you meet him there? I met him. At, I, I met him at West Side. He was running the shop. <laughs> like he he's like basically oh so you bought that there so he gifted this to me for free dang because what happened was that I went in there and um, I bought these two hoodies and one of them was too big and their stuff is size bigger yeah because their dudes are huge yeah. right so a medium for them like a lot of times a shirt if I buy a medium like from some Japanese designer it'll be like it'll fit my kid <laughs> Right, but you know, so I bought. I think I bought a medium hoodie, and it was like too big. And so I went in there and I changed the size out. And um, and he's like, "Oh, so, that, so we put you in some trouble to come here. You know, take, feel free to grab a hat." That's so cool. Yeah, and, and, and he was. He actually emailed me back. They're like, "If you watch, if you're if you're in town later this week, you, you feel free to come through and train with us." No way. Yeah. Did you go? No, I was. I wasn't gonna be in town. Oh. I was leaving like the next day. I don't. Oh. Even if I was in town, I don't know if I. Like I would have been intimidated as hell. Yeah. Like, have you have you seen the videos of that place? I've seen I've seen like a bunch of documentaries, yeah. and I I I started like uh, there was a time where I like tested out some of like the conjugate method. Yeah. And I really like the idea of. Um, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like most people do linear periodization. So let's say you're doing a bench press, yeah. right? Like they'll just that bench. one range of motion. Yeah. Yeah. But for them, it's like, you know, every twice a week, you would do different variations of the bench press. And I have, like, the football bar okay. that you that has, like, a bunch of different grips. And, mm -hmm. I mean, you can do floor press or whatever. And that's, that's sort of The football they... bar is the skinny one, not the trap. That's the trap one, right? Yeah, that's the trap one. 
Football bar is the one to the right. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's called a uh, multi grip bar too. Okay. I think I think it's called a football bar. Okay. I think so. Okay. But go, going back to your question about mentorship. Um, oh, I thought we were segueing into fitness, but go ahead. Yeah, and that's, that's that's why I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to pull it back. I I think it's the most important thing because. Um, and actually, you know, there's the ayah in the Quran, right? Like, ask the people that know yeah. about the things that you, you don't, don't know, see, right? right? It's, yeah. a, it's as simple as that. And right. so if you're like, I want to understand this. So let's say I, I recently asked this uh, um, of someone on my podcast. I saw her present um, before. This was like two years ago, and I actually never asked her. Right. Um, but she gave like an unbelievable presentation. I remember like leaving and I was like, wow, that was one of the best presentations I've heard. And I respect like the sales hustle, right? Yeah. Um, and she told me about the Minto method and how you can structure presentations in a way that is a little bit more effective and easy to follow and that type of thing. And I bought a book on it. But I think a lot of times, okay, so mentorship is the person relationship. But I'm going to go back to that disc- that uh, class that I went, that like all day seminar with Sheikh Hussein Abdus Sattar. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was unbelievable was he was like, if you're going to meet with, uh, if you as a murid want to meet with a sheikh, like it should be minimum like one time a year. And I'm like, what are you going to gain from meeting with somebody one time a year? And then I thought about, well, most people don't actually take the direction that they're given. So like you talked about your podcast, right? Yeah. You told me when we sat down, like there, there are services like Lipson that you can use or you can use Anchor. You know, you need a microphone, you need this. You said most people don't take that advice, right? Right. And so the value of a mentor-mentee relationship uh, or I should say the, 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 the value of having a mentor is actually doing what they tell you to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And so like the Larry, um, I asked him what's, what's one of the books that you recommend and he told me quality is free. I ordered it right away um, and I read it, completely changed my life. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and that's happened so many times, right. you know, where, where you ask somebody a recommendation and I, I, I kind of feel like I, I read too wide. And I need to be more focused. Okay. But I mean, I'm just happy you read. Yeah. I mean, how did that? It's good, but it also becomes like a lot of like you need to defragment and stuff like that. I've heard a lot of people who, after years of reading, they get rid of like a ton of their books and they just keep like the 50 or whatever that have really impacted them and they just keep rereading those. Is quality is free a book you can read in a day? I did a podcast episode on it. So. I know. I, I listened to that episode, yeah. but I, but I, um, I haven't. I, I, Thought about ordering the book. Yeah. Can you read it in a day? I mean, how, there's how, 24 how hours in a day. So I think <laughs> how many pages is it? A couple hundred. Um, maybe 200. Something like that. Oh. Some of it, some of it is more, uh, exi- some of it is more like procedural. Is it like a textbook? No, no, no. It's, uh, I avoid textbooks. I just, I can't like get into them really. But it's, it doesn't read like a textbook. No, 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 not at all. It reads like a book book. So it's like a 200 page book. Yeah. That's but you, but you would get, you would get the gist of it. Um, the philosophy of it is the first maybe hundred pages yeah, or so. Yeah. And the second part of it is if you were trying to like mature a quality organization mm. or mature an organization for quality. And so it's more procedural. If, if you were, if you were like a, well, you are a senior manager in quality, but if you were like a direct, like, uh, if you ran a quality department, would you make that required reading for all your underlings? Is that, is that uh, kind of book? Some or? permutation of, I mean, I, th- I uh, like, I don't, I don't believe in required readings, right? Because okay. like, how do you know somebody read something or how do you know that they digested it? You, right? you give them an assessment, have... you give them an assessment. If they fail, you, they get fired. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, what, one of the, one of the guys that I talked to before I went and got my CQE, and he's actually not CQE an engineer. is a certified quality engineer. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and so um, uh, he's not an engineer. I think he's bio. I think he's micro. Okay. That's, I think that's what he studied. One of the smartest engineers that I know, though he's not an engineer by training, but yeah. beast mode. Yeah. You know, right. kind of like you said about David. I'm not talking about David, yeah. but this is kind of like right. David. Right. Um, and so. It's funny, his, this, the other guy's name is David. <laughs> but so anyways, so he told me, like, what he was telling his boss that he wanted to um, get, a, get a CQE. 
and his boss was like, good, you better study for it, otherwise, like, you're going to get fired, as a joke, you know? Yeah. And he was like, you know, uh, I, should, I should know this. And he goes, so I spent the next three months studying like crazy. Yeah. There was no chance I was going to fail that exam. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to my brother-in-law yesterday, and I was like, how do you study? Because he, he's, like, more of a night owl. He studies at night. And he studies, like... He, He's super into artificial intelligence and like machine learning and stuff. Sure. And, you know, he, he's like, he studies from like 9 p.m. ish to midnight. Okay. Almost every day. And I'm like, I mean, does, that's his time block. Is that his deep, like, would you call his deep, deep work time block? I, th I think so. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he knows so much. And so they're going back to like the people that have it figured out. Yeah. It's like, there are some people, there are some, it's not many that have literally spent their entire life learning, you know? Like, they, they, like if you meet somebody who's like, say, um, I don't want to spit out an age, but you meet somebody who's a little bit older than you, but they've spent the last 20 years, three hours a day learning, like, it's just an unbelievable compound effect, right? Okay. They know so much. But I was asking him about, like, his... Uh, his study habit, and he was like, I do, I do nine until midnight focused work. Um, and now, is he a student? Yeah, he's taking some classes. Yeah. So, but he's... So he, I think he's working on his, like, third or fourth master's or something okay, like that, but or a PhD. Does he program. go to school? So, he's a full-time student? No, no, no. He's, a, he's an engineer with multiple kids and is, like, studying at night after his kids go to sleep, and he's done with work. <laughs> you know what I mean? He needs to be on a podcast, too. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd highly recommend. He's, he's like... Uh, it's, it's really nice. I, I actually try to put myself as much as I can in, you know, right? Like you're, you're, uh, you, you're on the... The like, religion like show, of your friends. Yeah, like show me your friends, I'll show you your future type thing. Yeah. I try to be like bottom rung of the ladder in all like my friends groups. Yeah. yeah. And so like he's just eons, mashallah. Okay. But going back to what I was saying about the, the three hours a day. I was like, I mean, you're in this class... Uh, that's what I'm saying, bro. The, the, the lower weights get dusty, you know? I'm, yeah. I'm, only, I'm, I'm usually down here. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid joke. But yeah. Anyways, um, so I was like, I mean, it, are they that rigorous? Like, is it required that you're spending three hours a day? And he's like, I mean, are you talking about, like, passing a class or are you talking about, like, getting good at this stuff? You know? It's right. like that. But to, to close out mentorship, right? Yeah. If you ask somebody who knows... Yeah. What you need to know right. and you do what they say. Right. Like that it's as simple as that. And that's 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 what Rick said. Rick I think added a little more to say like if you're if you're struggling to find because they also build on themselves, right? Like yeah. I had um this one guy, Chris Sai, he gave me a training years and years ago on design for manufacturability and assembly. And hadn't kept up with him a ton, but um for me it was like a tool that was spectacular and so I had him on the podcast right and he was like oh you got to talk to my friend uh, Skip yeah right and so you know as soon as you get like a couple they tend to uh, yeah. like it's like a doctor you know yeah. like go see yeah here's a referral right type thing um, but it, it 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 boils down to one asking first yeah most people won't turn you away mm. but if you're it's, it's, even if people turn you away you just ask somebody else right right um, that's number one and number two actually do what they say which is there's it's usually a breakdown in one of those people aren't asking right. because they're they're caught into there's a book called Who Moved My Cheese. Have you heard of oh, it? That's old school. Yeah, it's super old school. Yeah, I've yeah. never heard of it. I had a guy, and I, I, I ask everybody, what is a book that you give as a gift? Yeah. I got that from Tim Ferriss. Right. Um, and he said, you know, he said the Quran. <laughs> and then he's like, um, uh, but I've given my kids Who Moved My Cheese. Right. And most people get like into the wheel of, why, why aren't I finding mentors? Why aren't I doing this? And, and da, da, da. Instead of just like, okay, I'm going to go ask somebody else. I'm going to go ask somebody else. And if you're just asking all the time, then you'll get a ton of advice. And then you can just take it. Yeah, you know, I uh, really appreciate I, I want to actually, before we get into the fitness again, like you, since you mentioned books a lot so far. Um, this reading hat, like how do you, uh, what are your, so you, you're, you're a data, you have 
two kids, yeah. mashallah, your dad, husband, um, work isn't like, if you don't have like a, I don't know if you have like a super chill job, right? You wouldn't say that? Because um, you know a lot of guys, they work remote and then they're half the time, they're like doing their passion project, they're not really working. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Um, it, it, and it's all because, because I look at work as practice, right? Yeah. Like everything that, it's, a, it's all one wheel, right? right it's right. pointless. It's pointless to go and try to read something if you're not going to try to apply it. Right, right. You know what I mean? So I think for, for me, the work is where it's like the, it, it's where you're actually practicing what you're learning. So Yeah, sure. So you've got work, you've got your, you know, your fitness stuff, which we'll get into. Um, what are there... And then um, your podcast, right? Yeah. So and then your family. So are those like the four the big things in your life right now that you're that you that you continually work are working on? I'd say so. Yeah. Um, and do you think you're at your limit, or do you think you have t- like because I think we talked about like jujitsu in the past. And you talk about maybe having that for your kids, or your spouse, your wife, or something. You know. Yeah. Um, but like, do you think you're maxed out, or like because sometimes you feel like like I feel like okay, you mentioned this three hour time block. We talked about. Cal Newport talks about time blocking, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I could find three hours, but then, okay, but I got Arab, so I'm doing Arabic, right? I'm asking, I'm using you as a consultant now. So I got like Arabic <laughs> class twice a week, right? My, my instructor's always like kind of, he says I'm doing pretty good compared to the, his other students, yeah. but I feel like I could do be more. I, I, I'm not internalized. I'm, not, I'm just like barely, I'm like barely hanging on. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, you know, my, my, my favorite, like, you know, I, 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 my favorite intro line is still, Hal la deka You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I got to get beyond that a little bit more, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like the guy who, who I have cats in my pants in Spanish. Got right? It. right, right. So, um, you know, you got that... Um, so then, I look, but I look at these, look, okay, I can find probably two to three hours, but I'm like, okay, I got to go to the, I got to hit the gym. There's Arabic, there's podcast. I think it's like, what do I do in those two, three hours? I want to, and I want to learn something or I want to study or I want to like improve the skill up for work. I feel like there's just too much crap, like all fighting for these two to three hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and then you want to read a book, like I, I've, I've got a recording, um, uh, about the Mughals, right? And I was supposed to read this book and I skimmed it and I just picked certain things up. And I was like, man, I could have read this whole book. But it was like so much other things going on, right? So I guess how do you, how would you practically implement, like I feel like that's where a lot of people are falling short, including myself. It's like, okay, we can find the two hours, but then it's like figuring out what to do those two hours with. Because I don't want, you don't want to be the guy that's like only studying and then letting himself not get into the gym and not being physically fit either. Mm-hmm. Right? I feel like there's like a trait. Sometimes you see people who are like really smart, but they look like they look like shit. <laughs> so. There's a there's a there's a bodybuilder who um, I really like because like most most of the people look at some of the bodybuilders like they're just meatheads, right? Yeah, but yeah. some of them are like uh, you know giant philosophers, you know. But one one of the one of the guys that I really like, IFBB pro named Evan Centapani. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember what his nickname was. Anyways, yeah, I, I, I'm me. familiar with him. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of his uh, meal prep videos. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like, one, he's not eating like it's all like rice and turmeric, olive oil, you know, like lemon juice right. and and a grilled chicken breast, yeah. and super clean, right? right? He's not eating like garbage, like a lot of people think they they eat like. Yeah, one of the things he said is if if you're uh, if your diet is an afterthought, your body will look like an afterthought, you know, kind of like you said. Yeah. Um, see, I, I, I think of it like most of the time, most of the results are captured by a little bit of work. Okay. So like you, you can get a significant amount of results if you're working out 20 minutes a day. Right. You know, you don't need... I heard that on Mind Pump actually recently. Yeah. And, and even, even Jeff Nipper just recently put out a minimalist video yeah. about minimalist training and I bought his program okay um, because I wanted to see how he structured it but yeah the point is like I, do, I personally sorry I, I personally I tap the microphone I personally don't read like there are sometimes like I, I tried to get into the habit on Sundays yeah. where I would um, 
like go to a, a coffee shop and just try to close out a whole book. Mm. Um, and I did that a, like a, a few times, but it was hard to manage scheduling wise. Um, I think especially, especially when you have a lot going on, it needs to be less focused on um, result and more focused on process. Okay. So like if you can, if you can like the weight aside in terms of like how much weight are you pushing or the time aside in terms of how fast are you racing. Right. Like if, if you have a ton of responsibility, the focus is can I run three times a week with this going on? Because once, one, it's just a season of life, right? Yeah. Like especially if you talk to older people, who are like empty nesters or who have like, we have young kids, right? Yeah. It's just high oversight, you know, right. significant time commitment. Yeah. But like, as they get older, like I remember going in and staying at my brother-in-law's house uh, out of town. Yeah. And like, I woke up early and I was just chilling with my, with my baby daughter. And like the two kids came down and they like poured themselves cereal and they're starting to eat it because their parents are still asleep upstairs. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're like eight or nine or whatever. Right. But it's just like, if you think of it, like I just need to get, I just need to like set this habit and, and be consistent for the next few years, the time and the weight and all that will come later okay. when I have, when I have more time, you could think of it that way, or you can just track like one thing. So, so going back to reading, or how you prioritize a couple hours. Um, for me, I think of it like one one is like you know the that four square diagram of like urgent, yep, yep. urgent and must. I do. think like uh, Stephen Covey right? came up. With it. Well, I don't know if he came up with it, but he talks about it a lot. The, yeah. the quadrants: urgent versus what's important. So you have high yeah. urgent and important. Yeah, low urgency but important. And most people focus on high urgency and not important and a lot of not important. Exactly. Right. 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 And so, yeah. and so that, that's the, that's like the first thing. Yep. Right. Particular, particularly like at work. Right. right. Uh, you definitely don't want things slipping and you want to work on like the things that are important. Right. Um, actually I think at, at work it's probably three, the, the top, the, the, the top three sort of things like those need to be managed really well. Yep. In terms of what you do personally in those two hours, um, I think what is the most important learning? Yeah. Like what is the thing that I need to patch up to get me mm. to the next step? And so if I, I can tell you for me now, right? Uh, I've been looking at like the healthcare system and just trying to understand it. Um, and so for me right now, like every, every, every like whenever, whenever I have time to mm -hmm. read, mm -hmm. I'm reading this pretty big book uh, called "Who Has the Best Healthcare System" or something like that okay. by Zeke Emanuel. Okay. And so that, I guess that's that's how I approach it. Okay. But but I also I don't want to give off like a perception that I'm reading like a book a day or whatever. Right. Um, I typically will read like five or ten pages a day on average. Okay. But that's sometimes fifty pages in one day. Mm. You know, in terms of reading books, I have to read a lot for, you know, work and stuff like that. But in terms of like sitting down and physically reading a book, I'm really happy so long as I opened a book and spent, you know, five or 10 minutes reading it. Okay. And um, Ryan Holiday actually talks about this a lot. Like people are focused on uh, taking books in like they're almost accolades, mm -hmm. you know, like... Uh, you know, if, if you have a shelf full of books that you've read, um, you want it to grow, right? I want to have read a hundred books this year, but sometimes it's only like one page in a book that you really need to read. And it's just a bunch of fluff. So like Cal Newport's book, deep work, mm -hmm. I kind of read that one cover to cover, mm -hmm. but sometimes I'll pick up a book and there, there, there was actually one guy you had on your podcast. I don't know his name. Naveed. Uh, he talked about books a lot. Well, there's two. There's one like old, old one. It was like Omar Osman. I he, think it was that one. I think that it was, was that old. One. I was like from a couple years back. Yeah, yeah. I think it was that one. Uh, like, cause I call him the Muslim Ryan Holiday. Oh, really? Yeah, Mashallah. Yeah. So, so as far as reading goes, that that side of things, like, yeah, he's, he's always been someone that I've like respected as like a, as someone who's always like read a lot of material. Like, he's organized book clubs and he like writes posts about reading. So, yeah, yeah. So. That, that's the thing is like um, you don't have to read a lot and you don't have to 
you know, read things cover to cover. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you, if for me, once I like remove the anxiety of that, I found it okay. much more enjoyable. I and it's like, uh, most of the time, if you read the intro, like the intro will cover kind of what yeah. the book is about and right. the rest is just supporting arguments. Yeah. And how many times do you need the stats? And you know, you, you typically don't. Um, Ryan Holiday also talks about like, you know, just depressurizing kind of the whole thing of like, this is a $10 book, right? Yeah. You, like $10 is like a sandwich. Yeah. If you got a, if you got a perspective change for 10 bucks, like that's a really good ROI. Right. right. Um, but just like the, the final, fi final thing on that, I think, um, there are some books you have to read like a significant portion and sometimes you even have to study them. Like quality is free. I feel like I'm going to read that like once a year. Okay. Till the end of time. But how, how do you capture the information? Because, you know, Ryan Holiday has that whole index card methodology. Have you ever tried that? I have a box <laughs> upstairs. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to try that. But um, what I'm trying to work on now is just like, you know, being a better reviewer. Because okay. I think even for, for you to get something on an index card, you need to go back and review it, right? Yeah. And so I think that's where, for me, the lapse is. Right. Um, because that sounds like, like I even bought myself a box with some yeah. index cards, but I haven't done jack, right? Yeah. I, I think you're just sometimes, because you don't want to like let it be so crippling because you'll have a book. Like I always carry like a book um, in, my, in my work bag, right? But the, one of the problems being in the office is that like sometimes when I break, you don't want to like, like I'm very cognizant of perception at the office. Okay. Like, um... And maybe it's because of how I also view others. Like, like if I walk by someone's cube and they're like looking up recipes on at like 10 a.m., I'm like, this dude's a bum, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like this person doesn't have nothing to do, et cetera, et cetera, right? So even if it's on your lunch break, if it's your lunch break, okay, I get it. They're asking people eating lunch and they're watch, watching a video. I don't really care. But, um, and plus my guys, the, my, my team, they're always like, even during lunch, they're like working through lunch. Mm. Um, looking up parts and looking at how to source different things. So for me to like open up a book, I feel like in the middle of the workday, just seems like I got to go hide somewhere to do it. Interesting. Like, like I don't want to be like seen reading a book. I, I used to have a coworker in my last job. He used to read the Bible. He, he used to read the Bible at his desk. Really? And his LinkedIn picture was actually like, um, he, was, he took a selfie and he had the Bible open on his work desk, right? And he got perceived as like kind of like a slack, you know, a slacker, you know, in that sense. Because mm. um, I, th I think that's what people are like. Well, you got time to read this like non-work related book. I'll open up a book if it's like there's a book I've been going through called Common Sense uh, for for manufacturing. Oh, you know, it's for like more reliability. It's like if you ever take become like a certified maintenance reliability professional, what they call CRM, CMR, CMRP. They uh, feel like you read that book, or so I have no problem if I have like a textbook open. Mm. Right or a qual I think quality is free. I could I could get away with that, right? Yeah. But if I'm reading something that's a little bit more like like the, the enemy, book. Yeah. right? Or like a Ryan Holiday book or um, something like that, I might be um, a little. It, it, it would just be like I, I think a lot of it is me being like self aware or just being very because I'm very cognizant of perception. I, I'm the guy that if I'm gonna be running a few minutes late to work. I go through the back entrance <laughs> so nobody sees me when I come in, right? Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't know if it's old habits from the mill because FaceTime and like presence on the office was always something that was like drilled into us. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think... know how healthy it is to be honest, but it's something that I cog I'm cognizant of and I think people are cognizant of it. Even people, they, they say they are not. I'm like, I'm, I'm on a little like tangent there, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that that's like a, a fear thing, like a, a fear of a, like you said, perception. Yeah. And ultimately, um, you know, the, the way that you carry yourself, I also think matters. So like, yeah. if, if the results are there, yeah, then True. essentially what, what is it? But, but it's, it's a hard thing to like. The, I have a quote here that's, that says something like, sometimes it takes like years of playing to play like yourself. And, you, you know, sometimes it's just like uh, you got to you got to just be yourself. 
I was gonna ask you something real quick. The seltzer water you got, do you drink it with the espresso at the same time or is it like after? I'd say together. Really? <laughs> yeah. So is I, ice I like Americano it. still counts as a... If you yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, like, I have an iced Americano. I, I sometimes... For, for, I typically don't drink uh, seltzer water with uh, iced Americano or like a latte or something yeah. like that. It's just that, you know, I, I wanted to have it just in case I wanted it. Is, is it like you something you drink with like a straight like espresso with shot? With an espresso shot, it has to... For me, like it has to... And for like, uh, oh, so it's not even a cappuccino necessarily wouldn't be. No, 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 I, I wouldn't. Okay. I mean, you could do whatever you want, right? So but like, people, what's like, what's the benefit of? Is there a benefit, or is it like a taste combination? Um, I haven't looked into it. It's just been like, uh, what's what's the word? Um, shoot. Not Tashbi, but like... Taklid? Taklid, yeah, exactly. Taklid, what, Sidi Omer? Well, no, it's, this is like a common thing in, in coffee. Like when, it, when, it, when I was a barista, it, many times you would serve an espresso with... Uh, really? With, with uh, a cup of seltzer water. It's very common. Uh, I don't know why they do it. My personal experience with it is when I drink espresso, it really dries out like my, my tongue. Ew. When I, no, I should say, when I drink espresso and I drink seltzer water with it, it dries out my tongue in a way that's like some in some way pleasurable. And, and, then, and then you guzzle water after, and it's great. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to like because you, 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 you. I could pull you a shot of espresso when we're done. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll drink the salsa water. Yeah. But I think that the thing of it is when you when you called me, um, but when I was driving to the show, this guy calls me and he's like, "Hey, what kind of coffee do you want? like?" I'm like, "What do you mean? Like as long as I'm decaf, I don't care." <laughs> Cause I figured you're gonna give me like a Keurig pot or something, yeah. and I forgot to do this like coffee. Like you're like that's one of your things, and you you probably got the whole setup. But I was like, dang, because I had at my work we had this thing called Excellence Awards where you can get like, um, where if you do something great, people will start giving you awards and they're at cash value, and you mm. can redeem for stuff up the up the website. And they had this like Breville, I think like thousand dollar espresso chef set. Really? Yeah, and I've got like I think five hundred and fifty bucks so far in my account. I could probably, I should probably get a. I mean, and I'm like, should I just hold off and like get that? But it's it takes up so much counter space, and my wife is always annoyed because I've got like a freaking Nespresso machine that I'm just like. Do you like it? It does the job, I guess. But I'm thinking about giving it away. One of my coworkers, um, colleagues, she's um, talking about like they just do espresso shots in the morning because they work in the labs. And you know, because of GMP, you can't like have like coffee there. You have to just mm. chug it quickly on the way or something. Right. And some of these, some of these like operator operating techs, they just have to stay. And I was like, I was like, you should get an espresso machine. I was like, maybe I'll sell to her secondhand. <laughs> Clear that space. Uh, my, my whole coffee setup is secondhand. Yeah. Because it's home espresso is very expensive. Yeah. yeah. How how much would you ex- like retail um, for like a? You, would you expect to pay a thousand bucks or more? For like a, a good setup, uh, retail like more. brand more, more more yeah like two grand in that ballpark. If you're if you're buying full price, you can you can get like under a thousand if you're buying secondhand. Okay, um, but there's a there's an espresso machine part, there's a grinder part, and then there's like some other stuff that that you need like a tamp and some. How long does that stuff? take you to make in the morning? Like you like you made me this cappuccino. How long does it take to make it? Uh, a minute. Really? Yeah. I mean, so here's the thing, right? Like with with home espresso machines, mm-hmm. by and large, they're single boil, boiler. Yeah. And and they're single group heads. So yeah. like when when I learned, it was double boiler yeah. and two group yeah. heads. Yeah. And so like you could you could do multiple drinks at the same time. Right. Um, and also the with with the boilers, right? like a commercial or a really nice home machine like if you're going to spend three grand on your machine yeah you can uh, there's actually one my, my the one that i have it's called a ranchilio uh sylvia mm-hmm. they have a ranchilio sylvia pro mm-hmm. that is about two grand that is a double boiler mm-hmm. and the benefit of that is you can steam and also pull espresso at the same time because okay. they're two boilers mm-hmm. whereas uh Anyway, so yeah, basically the way I pull the shot, I grind the beans, yeah. pull the shot, uh-huh. and then I I have to wait for my water to steam so that I can steam the milk. 
because because it's a single boiler. But uh, if I had a saucier setup, <laughs> you know, I would just steam while the shot is being. But cooked. I feel like you know. I, like I can appreciate, you know, one of the things about helping like guys live a deep life and like gains craftsmanship through work, but like being being a good host, right? Mm -hmm. That they talk about this in like uh, I was talking to Ubaid Allah Evans about this. Like mm -hmm. that's part of manliness, like being able to host well, and yeah, sometimes you feel like you just like, especially if I have someone like Umer over, like I mean, <laughs> he asked me like, "What do you have for caffeine?" I was like, "I got pre workout, three hundred and thirty milligrams." <laughs> <laughs> the rule run how much <laughs> how much citrulline do you want <laughs> you know you know or it's just like because because he you know you, you know umer will bring over like a bag of intelligentsia or something um and where I, can i grind this you know you know and i'm like i have a walmart ten dollar grinder yeah the spice grinder and then i've got like the um nespresso machine with the pods and it's nespresso, like a i think is actually nespresso it's, it's not that's what i said nespresso uh, yeah, nespresso yeah. the pods yeah, yeah they're not bad they're not bad. Yeah, but but for a coffee aficionado, isn't it like blasphemous to use pods? I hate, uh, like I typically don't use the word hate, but I hate pretentiousness in coffee. Okay. I hate it. It's like number one turn off. Do you drink Dunkin'? I personally don't because I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, but I do drink Starbucks. Okay. Yeah. So you're not, you're not. I, and, and I would drink Dunkin'. I, like you just don't want to taste. Like, for yeah, me, Dunkin', like does, Dunkin does not wake me up. Oh, interesting. I, I, I need to go for Dunkin' to work for me for caffeine. I need to have at least a, like a turbo. Yeah. Starbucks, well, so, so a turbo. You know, the turbo is like the coffee with the espresso shot inside. Oh, interesting. That's what that is. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. it's like a uh, red eye, right? That's Maybe, yes. Yeah, right. So it's basically that, that right? Coffee, black, you know, and then. So, because the regular coffee, I'll sometimes it puts me to sleep. Oh, really? <laughs> Because like I don't know I don't know if they still do it but they used to if you go, if you got a small coffee yeah. they'd come in like the this tiny little paper cup yeah and then once you got a medium it would go to styrofoam when did you get into coffee um 20 15 or something like that. That was like, wow, you were working, you were obviously in industry. I was working, yeah. And then you picked up a, a weekend job as a barista? Yeah, I did. Like yeah. just for, your marriage, does your, your wife look like, you're already working during the day or the week and then why are you working yeah. extra? Yeah, well, she, I mean, she, she was she was working back then too. And uh, you know, it, it's a blessing that we're in Chicago and we have a ton of family and friends, right? right? right. So, I mean, Alhamdulillah, we, we were we were making use of like the weekdays that I you know I wasn't working. But right. Yeah, uh, I was I was switching jobs, and I remember I was I was leaving Baxter at that point, and I wanted to to get um, exposure to quality. I actually just wanted to do like a brief stint in quality, okay. just to get the experience so that I can do. It wasn't like a, you know I mentioned the the becoming exceptional. Right. It wasn't like. A, it wasn't premeditated that right. I was going into quality because I thought I would like it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do new product introduction eventually. Right. Um, and I was like, I, I could use a, the advice that I was given was go into quality. So okay. I also wanted to open up a coffee shop at that same time. Okay. And so I moved, I moved to quality. Yep. And uh, I started working on nights and weekends as a barista. It is before kids. Before kids. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it was before kids. Um, and after, after doing that for a little bit, I realized, uh, that, are we good? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I heard, I heard, I heard some beeping me. going off. That's, yeah. Is that upstairs? Could be. No. Uh, but yeah, so, um, I started working on, uh, nights and weekends. Yep. And after, after like getting orders and making coffee and learning how to do all the stuff, right. it was just like, I got... I sort of got what I wanted after making like 10 drinks or something like right. that, you know? And I started talking to a bunch of people about like the, the business of coffee and mm. it's like, it's a low margin, high volume for you to, yeah. for you to make it. And it was just like, uh, I'm not really enjoying this part of it as much as I thought I would. Yeah. And I'm really enjoying my work. Right. I like my work work. Yeah. And so it just sort of became a hobby. Okay. But now but now I don't have like this pipe dream of, you know, eventually I'm going to open up a coffee shop and and kick it and and that because I I did it 
Yeah. You know? I hear you. And I, maybe, maybe like long term in the future, I would do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely not more than like a few hours a week type thing. It wasn't one of those things that, you know, people, you, you heard Tim Ferriss, you've seen Tim Ferriss's like tea video, his like tea, routine, his, well, you know, he does his, like mushrooms, his daily routine right? video or like, yeah, yeah, yeah I have, well, I you know, he'll, 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 he'll be very specific about his tea. I don't like, man, what the hell dude? It's just like, like, like to me, it's like almost so brain, it sounds super interesting. And it's the idea of being like cultured and all that, but it's like, you gotta like spend all this time and like learn it first. Yeah. To even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I think for coffee, it's like, yeah, there's, there's this thing, but it's like, you have the mental energy to do it. And I feel like kind of, in one sense, I'm like, yeah, I, I'd like to learn more of it, but like you, it's something that sounds interesting, but you have to like, all right, um, I'm not like complete there yet. And, I, and I've kind of like be forgiven myself in the sense that like, all right, maybe at some point I'll get super interested in it and then I'll pursue it. You talk about you were big into cologne, right? Fragrances, yeah, dude, right? Yeah. Was when when did you get into that? Uh, so I um, I feed off of people's energy a okay. lot, right? Um, and or I should say I try to do that on purpose. Sure. And so when when I see somebody really interested in something, I actually did a post on human factors recently on yeah. LinkedIn that like I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually I find human factors engineering interesting. Okay. Um, you know, the more people that you talk to that are interested in something, the more it's it's like I said, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Like yeah. you, you end up being interested in it just by uh, yeah. having like the friction with those people. Right. I was sitting down with a friend of mine, uh, and a very very passionate guy. Yeah. You know, just about like his descriptions and like whenever he. Like it, he'll he'll eat like a, a a bite of food and he'll like stand up and be like, oh my god, <laughs> really? you know that type of thing. Yeah, super eccentric guy. Yeah. Um, and so uh, he got a bottle of uh, cologne mm-hmm. uh, by Van Cleef and Arpels okay. called um, Midnight in Paris. Okay. And it's really really unique. It's like smoky. It's yeah. it, it's mostly smoky. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know what the notes are. I'd have to look them up, but. Just his reaction by it yeah. was just so unbelievable. And he's like, you know what? Let's go, let's go and smell some colognes. You right. Know? And so I went with him and it was just it was just like coffee. I was already into coffee at that point. Yeah. And he was like, smell this, this is that, smell this, this is that. And I got onto this site called Fragrantica, uh-huh. which which walks through like notes and you know, with, with each fragrance, there are like the notes the, yeah. of the fragrance, but then there's other things that people right. try to, um, you know, assign labels to it. For example, right. like, is this more of a day fragrance yeah. or a night fragrance? Is it a uh, fragrance for the summer or spring or right. winter or fall? Yeah. Um, and so like, for example, things that are more vanilla mm. or oud mm. or... Um, like if it has a heavy sandalwood or something like that, right. maybe more winter. Right. The more aquatic slash citrus, maybe more summery, and then some permutation of like the in betweens are the in between seasons. Right. Typically. Yeah. But then they talk about like longevity of a fragrance or the sillage, how much it spreads, right? And so yeah. most guys are like <laughs> Versace Eros, you know, or or uh, Paco Rabanne One Million, you mm. know, that type of thing. Just. And in the fragrance community, those are called like the beasts, you know, like the clubbing scents, uh, you know, uh, that just like you put two sprays, everybody can smell you and you're kind of like suffocating people. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, but it was, it was that guy just seeing how excited he was about it. Yeah. And I bought a bottle of that and then I started looking into it a little more and then right. I went smelling with him and mm. yeah. But mm-hmm. I actually, I, I, I've gone through phases before. Like okay. that, that, that was, a, that was something that I spent a ton of time on. Right. And then I just kind of pulled back. Yeah. And now, and now I'll, I'll buy like one bottle a year. Okay. Two bottles a year. W- what's your take? So I've, um, I've heard this thing, there's a thing called scent confusion, right? Scent confusion? Meaning that like, so you have like a beard oil that's a certain scent, your deodorant's a certain scent. Um, your body wash a certain scent, your cologne's a certain scent, but it's different. And mm-hmm. so you have scent confusion. Does that, have you ever heard of that as an idea? No. No, okay. I'll I get it you. though. I mean, I get it. So, like I have this one beard oil that's pretty potent yeah. and uh, I almost avoid using it sometimes, but mo- most of those things tend to dissipate pretty quickly. Like, really? like uh, 
I it's wonder. I, I think some brands use it as a marketing ploy, to be honest. Like the fragrance part? No, because like beard, like so. I I use beard brand, beard brand. Oh, products. I like beard brand. Yeah, yeah. So but I, I get their blank, their they have blank slate, right? They? That's their no. I, no I, un, uh, the one I I use what they call old money. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're that's about. the only one. It's my, like gold label, right? It's the one my wife would like because I because I basically asked for the fragrance sample, right? Yeah. Because like it was funny because I remember a few years ago she was like we she said something well. well <laughs> One of her friends basically like told her that like she basically like threw some cologne on her husband <laughs> to make him more attractive to her or something like that. And she was like, "Oh, let's go, let's go to the fragrance store, right?" And then she she picked out some like some I was like, I don't know, is it like some like B grade? We went to Orleans Square Mall, I think, and she just picked out this thing, and I'm like, "What's this? Like, all right, you like it?" She's like, "Yeah," and it's like it's it's almost like a Cheap. I don't know if it was cheap. It was still like eighty bucks or something, right? I guess yeah. that's not cheap. You don't remember what it was called? I have it still in my house. But then we had our third kid. You know how women in their pregnancies, their hormones get all out of whack and things change. Oh, and she couldn't like afterwards. She couldn't stand it anymore. She didn't like it anymore, right? Subhanallah. So like, I just paid eighty bucks. I, I used it a few times, and then like we're like, all right, this is whack. Air freshener for your car, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so I ended up um, going to uh, there's like beer brand. They talk about it. So I, I asked for a sample, right? And they gave me. Um, all the sampling, and I was like, pick one of these. And then she liked the old money one. So I just, I used old money for deodorant, uh, uh, utility bomb, styling bomb, sea salt spray, shit, everything. everything. Everything is old money. That's cool. You know what I'm saying? Mean, I mean, so so what's what's really nice about that is yeah. there, there's the concept of a signature scent. Yeah. Right? Like, right. old money is mahi. That's just how mahi smells. Right. All the time. Right. You know? And that's cool because yeah. because you're like super into fashion, right? Right, yeah. And so that's what changes. Although old money is more it's more for like if I was dressed it's for the people who are like you're dressed like in a suit all the time versus kinda of in the same thing. That's what that's what the archetype seems to be, because they had these archetypes. Like, because it doesn't necessarily match the archetype that I would dress. You know what I mean? See, I, I tried to do that before yeah. and it's just for me I feel like it's not a you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, like, I, could, I, I could, I could, I right. could wear Tom Ford or Creed or whatever in my pajamas. Like, yeah, I mean, I think that's where. Yeah, but you're talking about like you go through phases. Like, I use this show's called Sultans and Sneakers, right? Right. And I'm like, I think I feel like I'm a recovering sneakerhead now. Like, I, I'm just, yeah. I'm not copying as many sneakers. I've sold a lot, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm now referring more into like Japanese fashion and like StockX sticker <laughs> on your bottle. That's like one of the first things you noticed about like my bottle. I remember you always comment on that, right? <laughs> But it's like this how, but, but I'm more like Japanese fashion and like the selvage denim and all that kind of stuff, right? So yeah, I, I can appreciate how people are getting into that. Like you, you got to go through seasons. But I think having the idea, having a hobby, and, and, and I hope people aren't getting this like impression. Some I have some listeners like you guys are too much into the dunya. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, but it's like I I, I don't know if this is a, uh, I think it was. I'll just say what the story is because I don't know what the reference is. Sure. Because uh, you know I don't I don't want to get caught off reference, but you know one one of the one of the uh, salihin yeah. drank a cup of cold water, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know he 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 drank the cup of cold water, right. and it made him think of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right. And so it's like it's more aesthetic, technically, yeah. to drink lukewarm water right. on a hot day. Yeah. But if the cold water is reminding you of your Creator, like. That's yeah. kind of like the dunya cycle, but I got you. I got you. You know, if you're just if if you smell like, um, I have one perfume, yeah, that uh, is called uh, French leather by Memo Paris. Okay, and it is an unbelievable fragrance. Okay. Like every time I smell it, I'm like Subhanallah. You know, I should actually say Subhanallah, but every time I smell it, I'm like, this is such a unique scent. And yeah. it's so beautiful right. that it's almost like an existential kind of thing. I get it's so It's so different than uh, anything. I, I'll have you smell it, actually. For sure, for sure. It's rose and leather. All right, so, you know, we're here in a gym, home gym. We haven't talked, we, we've alluded to, like, mm -hmm. fitness stuff and whatnot. And I kind of, this is the, the final subject of the podcast today. You, I, I don't think I met you then, but you said you were at one point, 325 pounds. Yeah, big boy. Always a big bone kid growing up. Yeah, you, like I, I, you grew up on Mensaf. 
and like Makluba <laughs> and like <laughs> actually it's funny. Uzi. I I'm starting to like Mensaf now. I've never dude. Again, Mensaf never... is like my favorite food in the world. Subhanallah. It's like the last supper meal for me. I do. Like if 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 I ever got like a death penalty or something, I'm like <laughs> feed me Mensaf before y'all blow out the firing squad. You like it that much? Yeah. So what's really cool about Mensaf is I was in I was in the Middle East. I was in Palestine this past summer. Okay. And one of my cousins was getting married. Yeah. And so, like, the way that weddings work overseas is different than here. Okay. I, I mean, that was obvious, but I didn't, I didn't realize, like, how different. I don't know how they are in, like, India or Bangladesh or, or Pakistan, but um, basically the way that they... And, and what's interesting about Palestine is each balad or each village yeah. has, like, different customs. Yeah. And so for us, um, Friday is, like, right after Dhuhr, after Jum'ah. Yeah. They'll do a, a mensaf like feast, yeah. And so like two thousand people came or something yeah. like that. And then Saturday, I had to dip out Saturday morning, but Saturday oh, they had Chicago? like a reception. Yeah. Okay. Saturday they had like a reception. Yeah. Um, at a hall, and it was right. like a smaller thing. But Friday morning, like your cousins and the people that you're tight with, go and they prepare the mensaf. Yeah. And so like, there was like. 2,000 pounds of meat or something like that. It was, it was like unbelievable. I took, a, I took pictures of it because we had to load these giant, uh, what are they called? Giant like cauldrons. commercial, po- yeah, cauldrons yeah. full of meat into yeah. the back of like these trucks yeah, right. to get them up to the place where we were. And it was like uh, we were cooking outside. Right. Um, but yeah, I made Mensa for a few hours for like... Is Mensa like a street food in like Jordan and in Sham? What's, what's really interesting is there's... Um, I didn't know this, but now people are doing Mensa in a cup. So you can like pay like a dinar or something and you get like uh, maybe this size cup. Right. And so they put like rice and a little bread and a little meat and some of the nuts and stuff. And the jameed. And, and a little jameed. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of jameed. Like oh, really? my bella doesn't really do jameed. Oh, really? They do fresh uh, uh, fresh yogurt for the most part. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. My, 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 I, I went, one of my friends at Hyde Park, well, not, not Hyde Park anymore, but in the city, he basically always is like, I met him up last, he's like, we got to have you over some months, because his, his wife is off the boat in the city. Oh, really? Right, and they, they get the jemmy directly from there. Oh, really? Yeah. When, um, when, we, when my wife and I went to Turkey, because yeah. jemmy is like an Arab thing, it's not just Palestinian. Okay. But when I went to Turkey, yeah. my wife is Syrian, okay. right? And so it was as the, as the Arab Spring was happening, yep. and so a lot of Syrians went to Turkey, so one of my father-in-law's sisters yeah. was in uh, Ankara, I think. Uh, yeah, the capital. Yeah. yeah, and so she 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 sent some jamid right. to some some guy who met us in Istanbul where right. we were, right. so that we could give it to her brother, <laughs> and it was like. 20 kilos or something like that. Like it's like a block. I think they come in these like rounded balls kind okay. of thing. Um, it's funny, like there's some dust that, uh, the gym's not being know. used basically. Well, this, the, like I said, this part. Yeah. But anyways, it's like you, a hard you, angle to you, see. You should charge a membership at this place. It's, it's funny, you know, and, uh, this is like the, the way boiled down, uh, anyway, so the point of the Jameed yeah, story yeah, yeah. before I lose it is we were so far over our weight capacity that we had to like cut <laughs> loose but we had so much jameed in this carry-on yeah. like suitcase that we bought in turkey yeah that wasn't like that high quality so by the time we got to the airport all the wheels had fallen off <laughs> and so i was just carrying like 40 50 pounds of jameed because the suitcase had no wheels and and the handle was like vertical and it was gonna break open but but yeah, so um, it wasn't really worth it then. Yeah, so we 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 got rid of like some of it, okay. and then we we took the rest and some gotcha. of the bags. So back to being three hundred twenty five pounds. Like, yeah. how many years ago was this? Eight or nine. So you were married. You, you, I was married. Yeah, and yeah. you started, I actually you, start. I gained a little more weight after getting married. Of course, that always happens. Yeah, but it was it was actually like I used to I used to sell cell phones. Right, the first three yeah. Yeah. first four years, basically all through college. And then the last year that uh, I was in college, I got married. And so there's, and there's so, first of all, there's help for, for fat guys. There's hope to get married. 
<laughs> that's the first lesson here. I guess that's one lesson. Because <laughs> um, you were a big boy when you got married. You were, I did. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I was. Grade A personality, I guess. Mm-hmm. But um, So anyways, yeah. So I was, I was probably like, I was still pretty heavy. I was probably high 200s. Okay. Right? And then I got an office job. Yeah. Was commuting from downtown Chicago to Round Lake, which is like mm. 55 miles and like couldn't be worse traffic, right? Because I'm what doing 90, that? 94. That's like, that's like an hour and a half? 90 minutes? 90 minutes going and like two hours coming back. Ooh, yeah. that's gross. Yeah. And so actually it's funny. Like I got, I started my uh, job on like January 16th or sorry, June 16th or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then I remember commuting home on Labor Day weekend yeah right and I, I probably put on like 15 20 pounds yeah. in the first few months because i was sitting in my car for a couple hours a day sitting at my desk right and yeah. so even though i was already overweight like right. my movement went down yeah um but so i uh was driving home labor day weekend at like 4 p.m and it took me like four hours to get home <laughs> you know <laughs> It's like, how many podcasts are you going to listen? So I, I got home. My wife was starting her, her MBA program. Okay. Uh, and she, I think she had just started her MBA program. Right. I was like, sweetheart, let's move to Round Lake. So we got a sublease and we were like, yeah, Round Lake's not really for us because oh, yeah. um, it's like super far out. But. So you went to Round Lake or you did not? We did. Yeah. We lived, we lived there for five months or something oh, okay. like that. And then we were like, nah. Yeah. And then back to the city? Well, uh, then we moved to like a midway point. Then we moved to Wheeling. Okay, I got yeah, you. So like somewhere in between. Cause, sure. Because it was like, it would take us like 90 minutes to get to our families. And it's just like... I hear you. Yeah. Right, right. So so the anyways, wh- when did you have this epiphany that you're like, you got to do something? Well, so my dad, Alayda Hamo, died of a heart attack. And he wasn't like super overweight or anything like that. Yeah. Um, we have like heart issues in my family and stuff. And so I was like... I think 21 at the time, maybe walking up the stairs at, uh, at my job. And I remember just like being out of breath and it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, climbing the Hancock building, you know what I mean? It was like two very regular flights of stairs and I was winded by the time I got up there and I was just like, I feel like something's got to change. Yep. And I, I wasn't like, I was motivated, but it wasn't like that motivated. It wasn't like, it was like, something's got to change, but you know, if, if it dissipated, like it could, it could have dissipated it in like a day or two. You know what I mean? Was, did, did you get to that level? Like, as far as like, did you, oh, just over time, just not Long-term, pay attention yeah, to yeah. what you ate. You, would you say you were a foodie? You, you, were you, a, were you a food addict or anything like that? Or? Um, I guess it, it depends on how you, I, I would say I had a compulsion towards food and, and poor habits. So, oh, yeah. I mean, w- I think, would I think you be the guy on... like at your commute, right? So this would be like my bad habit, right? Especially when I was like non Yeah. Right. This would be a common thing. I would be like, I have, I'm leaving to work at like 430 or 5 from the steel mill in Northwest Indiana, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what kind of food's gonna be. We're gonna be at home. I'm kind of hungry now. I'm gonna pick up a 10 pack of sliders from my castle <laughs> and a shake and some fries and smash that. Cause, Cause I need something to do on my 45 minute drive. 45 <laughs> minutes is not even that long. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I like inhale like, like 10 sliders, some jalapeno poppers, some mozzarella sticks. Dude. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say... Um, Did you do stuff like that? Like, like really sometimes, like... Sometimes, yeah. sometimes, sometimes. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, you don't you don't get to, like, that heavy weight by, like, you know, eating lettuce and um, <laughs> tomatoes, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely had a compulsion towards it, but I also had other... I mean, I wasn't moving. Yeah. And so it's all, like, metabolic conditioning. Yeah. It's, it's like... A, it builds on itself, right? right. So it, as, as you get more and more fit, it's harder for fat to get on you. Yeah. And as you get more and more uh, overweight, mm. it's easier for fat to get on you and stick on you, right? Yeah. So it's like... It's compound interest in, exactly. in ways in either direction. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely had issues with food and mm. issues with how I was eating, but I was also not sleeping well Mm -hmm. and uh i I think it was mostly lack of knowledge and lack of presence Mm. um 
But yeah, so I, I was uh, I was winded, and then like I said, I had some level of motivation. I wouldn't say it was like all right, this is the day my life is going to change. It wasn't like that. Sure. But I went down and I sat down with Rick. Okay. And that's why Rick is like, now it's funny. Our relationship now is like, because he has so much going on and I have. Are Rick and you about the same age? I think so. Okay. I think he's he's maybe a little older than me by like a year maybe. Okay. But I, I think we're about the same age. Okay. And Actually, Rick was already in good shape. But he used to be overweight too. Oh. He used to be so overweight. When, so when... When this conversation, cause I remember Rick talks about this. You talk about it in the Rick in your show with Rick. Yeah, yeah. So he he used to be overweight. Then he uh, then he he got really fit. Okay. Um, and I sat down with him, and we were just talking about work stuff. And I was just like, man, you know, I uh, I feel like I got to make a change with with my health. Um, he's like, you know what? Come work out with me tomorrow. Okay. And it was just like a one workout became two. He showed me how to do everything. And what kind of workout was it? Like a strength training? Just like a joke of a workout now. But was it? it's like, uh, what, what, what's his name? Um, uh, you know, Chris Jones is? Chris Beast Mode Jones? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he talks about like hippie workouts. Okay. It was just like that. Like some banded exercises, you know, a couple of curls, like, you know, maybe. No compound lifts. If they were, it was like lightweight and okay. like super set with something else. It so was, was like, he was he out of shape? At the, Rick was out of shape at this point. No, he was in super good shape. Okay, yeah, he so. was in very good shape at that point. Okay, um, but that, I mean that's what it was. Rick like uh, and and after after like a month or two of training with him, yeah, because we would train at lunchtime. Uh, like at the and sometimes gym. after work, yeah. Okay, sometimes after work, um, but after a month or two of training with him, I was kind of like. Uh, good to go on my own and then um, we did a I'm doing the hot chocolate 15k um, mm. but I did it in 2013 or 2014 or something like yeah, that yeah. and it was like a almost 15 minute mile yeah you know? and um, yeah it's just it, it, it feels like so long ago but not that long ago. So you're talking about Rick's, you, the, the whole habit. The, so the fitness habit started with Rick. Yeah. But then as far as, did you change anything with your diet? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Like right away? kind of package deal. Yeah, right away. I started eating what I thought was cleaner. But but uh, like I'm, I'm just generally the type of person yeah. that dives deep into stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I started just spending so much of my time listening to... Uh, podcast like I started listening to uh, I think it's called fat burning man okay it's a really popular podcast I started listening to um, a bunch of different podcasts right um, started reading uh, health books started just like it, it all it all like added on on it it became like sort of a package but that's what it was it was just like um, I started changing slowly, and the the backbone of the change was really the Rick taking me to work out with him. Oh, really? So, and and that that just created it, and then it's like down. You know, um, did you? I it built it built it built my confidence because I started to see some results. Like okay. I started dropping weight as as I was eating a little bit cleaner, and then it wasn't until like a few years after that I started. Like I probably lost fifty pounds over the course of the first like year 18 months right and then the second 50 pounds was like slowly arduously over the course of like five years mm. or six years um yeah but were you ever like a, um so you talk about going diving in right i remember um i've tried a few things over the years right because I, I think for me it was a like gradual like i remember i was a skinny kid growing up South Asian guy. I was like 120 pounds when I graduated high school, mm. right? And then college, and then your metabolism at age 25, 26 just starts slowing down. You get married, you got all these invitations, and then you slow. And and our wives, generally Muslim women, don't seem to like care too much. Mm. I feel like about their husbands being out of shape. They might say something like, "I don't want you to have a stroke and leave me these kids." <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of their like mindset. It's more like. I need you to be around and not die on me. Yeah. But they don't like, I, I don't get this impression that they want a husband that's like jacked. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
And it's funny because when I, I remember we had a conversation maybe like two, two and a half years ago. Um, we were talking and um, you were telling me that I should hire a coach. Oh, yeah. Because I was just dabbling in different things and like trying stuff out. Not really making a lot of progress. Probably because my nutrition wasn't super dialed in. Right. And um, I ended up eventually hiring a coach about a year and a half ago. And a little over, a little almost two years now to be honest. But um I remember I talked to my wife about it because I spent a good amount of money, I think fifteen hundred bucks for a program. And How long was it? Ninety days. Oh, you know, so five hundred bucks a month. Um, probably had to get that enough to buy in to like we actually would do something. Like I feel like people that pay like twenty bucks for a month for a program, they kind of like blow it off. Yeah. Like how many subscriptions do people have that like they're just paying ten, fifteen, twenty bucks a month? They're not even paying attention to, right? And just like they're just paying out every month, right? But you're paying five hundred bucks a month for something you. Figured psychologically you're gonna do something about it, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, she was just like, I, cause I got, I had like, you spend that kind of money. I don't know how you operate your finances with your spouse, with your wife. Um, kind of was like, listen, this is gonna cost this much. She's like, well, it's your money. You can do whatever you want, right? And she, her always philosophy has been like, as long as your dietary habits don't affect me, I don't really care. Like, don't come in here and basically like, cause you know a lot of places. People, coaches will say, you got to go through your cupboard and like throw out all the junk food. Crazy, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, that's just not going to, that just wouldn't fly if I did that at home. My wife would like just get pissed. Yeah. Because for her, it's just like, because my mind, you're making a change, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so my, my mindset was always like, and I, I would always blame her for like when I was getting overweight. Because like it's your fault because if it you wasn't for you. making all this delicious food. No, it's not that. Uh, it's more like. It's a, very, it's a very simple example, right? For me, if my, my favorite ice cream is Andy's custard, uh, peanut you know butter, <laughs> melted chocolate chip, concrete. So to me, it's like, oh, if I want ice cream, I'd rather just go out and go to Andy's. Like if I really want it, I'll just go out and go to and drive to Andy's and get that concrete, right? Mm. But if I have it at home, I'll just eat it, whatever. I'll, I'll eat lower quality ice cream because it's just there. Sure. And my wife was like, because she's a medical field. She's like, I don't want, like, I worked all day. I don't want to go out again for ice cream. I want it handy. I want, like, like she, she always has candy and all that junk at home, right? And it, it would just be a war if I tried to, like, just throw it out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's something that, like, you single guys who are into fitness, maybe that's something you got to negotiate with your, um, with, your, with your fiance before. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like how I mean, do you I do don't, it? I don't think so. I you think, don't think so? No. I, because I, but, I, but I feel like it took a certain level to break through that. Because mm -hmm. a lot of guys, that's what they're, and their wives don't care about it. And therefore, it's just easier for them just to stay fat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, so generally speaking, I, I just, uh, the sources of variation yeah. are usually pretty consistent. Okay. Meaning, um, if, you, if you find, like, one person has talked about this before, like, do you, do you, when you count your macros, do you count vegetables? It's like, dude, if, you, if, you're, if you're gaining a pound a week, it's not because of onions and green peppers. Yeah, you know what I mean? right. So, like, it's like a majoring in the minors type thing. Yeah. So, if, if you consistently have ice cream and it's impossible for you to control yourself if there's that at home, yeah. then, you know, there may be a discussion that needs to be had about that, but there are varying levels of control that you need to build in and of yourself because the... I, I believe, obviously, I have a gym at home, so yeah. I obviously believe in catering your environment to, to, yeah. to set you up for health, but I, I think as far as, as far as like relationships go, whether it's like with family or with, with a spouse, yeah. many people get into this mode where I'm changing, so we all have to change together. And it becomes like a compound thing of um, not only am I changing myself, but I'm changing my entire family in the process. And I think that can sometimes get in the way of you changing yourself. Like in, in reality, if for example, every time you wanted ice cream, you had a diet Coke, yeah. you know, then you have, you have some sort of, uh, we call it reaction plan, right? It's yeah. Like, you know, it's like PFMEA, what's a reaction? Right, right. Right. It's like you got to implement your own personal control yeah. versus saying like, because I struggle too. Like I struggle with chips. I struggle with pasta. Um, those are probably like big hitters for me. Well, for me, you know, I, I think sometimes you have to take like, you know, like yesterday we had, uh, I went to my friend's place. We had, 
my friend hosted the, 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 the I don't know if you watch MMA or at all, or like oh, the, the, yeah. Isla, the Isla Makachev fight and yeah. with uh, Oliveira, right? Yeah. So I knew like you're going to watch friend, f- f- a fight with what was that like friend. Ten, It was at 1, 8, 1, 1, 1 or 2 p.m. Right, right. right. Yeah. And it was like he ordered pizza. My friend's pretty healthy. He ordered pizza, wings, or chips. I never eat chips, right? But he got those like the Ruffles Ridge ones, mm-hmm. right? The basic. And I'm like, as a kid, I said, man, you can inhale an entire bag and not even know it, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? But I knew going in... That that's that was that day was just not gonna that was gonna be an L, right? So I knew what I was gonna eat for breakfast. Why? What? So that's the thing. Like it's not an L. So if if like if the before and after are set up, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I guess so. But like David Goggins wouldn't do that. <laughs> but that, yeah, but I that's, guess that's, but that's so. But also like <laughs> if th- that's the thing too, right? Yeah, like you if you're comparing yourself against a Navy SEAL who runs 240 mile races, yeah, right, and that's is like true. a mindset coach, yeah, it's like you're never gonna, you're not even in the the ballpark. Like that's not a lay person aspiration. Okay. I love uh, Goggins, by the way, right? But um, I don't think that that's like a. I, I he's like beyond aspirational, right? I see. I yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Like I mean, I, I guess I have. I still like, cause it, yeah, cause you're right. I had it planned out. It's not like it was. I was planning to eat clean that day, and I'm like, oh, I go to my friend's house, and he happens to have pizza and wings. Like, yeah. obviously, duh. <laughs> like you're, I, he's he not have like chicken breath. Like first, I got there, and he was like, cause I had planned for it. I had like, I had a pretty light breakfast, so I go there, and he has only fruit. I'm like, what the hell, dude? Where's the freaking like junk food at? Like, in my head. He only had fruit first in the beginning, oh. and then he went and got pizza and wings and chips and stuff. Yeah. It came later. But at first, I was like, this dude, man, he's going to screw us. He's probably going to have like chicken breast or something later. <laughs> you know, I was like, and so, yeah, so I, I, I get what you're saying. But, I, like, as we wrap up here, what, like, fitness is one thing, getting in shape. But now getting into, like, you did Iron Man last December? Half, half Iron Man. Half Iron Man, okay. Yeah, last December. All right. And now you just ran a Chicago Marathon, like, a few weeks back. Yeah. Okay. So now this is like taken, I think, the, the, there's like, um, what's required from a mindset point of view to even think about doing an Ironman? It's starting slowly and, and you have to want to do it, actually. Like, that, when, when, when I saw, like, Goggins do the 240 mile, I think it's a Utah uh, race. Yeah. And people do, like, these crazy The ultras. Things. You know Peter Atea? Yeah, Peter Atea. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he used to do these, like, ultra swims, mm. right? And so, though, like, you need to understand why you kind of want to do it. For me, I remember, like, because f- I told you I started getting really into f- watching fitness videos and stuff like that. And yeah. I remember being, like, fat yeah. and watching, like, an Iron Man video and thinking, that's the opposite of who I am now. Yeah. You know? Right. And so if I, if I ever got to that point, then that's, like, goals for me. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, I want to finish. Yeah. It's like, I want to be an Iron Man. You know what I mean? And so the difference is like a process mindset. So like I, I, I did the Chicago marathon and I, I raced slower than I thought I could go mm. because my goal was to finish the whole thing or to run the whole thing, I should say, and execute a race strategy because it was like, uh, this was, inshallah will be the first of many. Mm-hmm. So the, the main takeaway that I wanted out of it was I can execute a race strategy and I can run an entire marathon. Yep. I ran 24 miles straight mm. and then had to pull back the last two miles because my toe started hurting. But I think... What do you is, mean? You just walked the last two? Walked and ran. I okay. think the last two miles were maybe like 15 minutes. Yeah, everything before that was like 12 minutes. 12 minute pace yeah. for, for 24 miles. Yeah, because I, I looked at all my training yeah. and I was like, even on my worst runs, yeah. I maintained 12 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like I did uh, 20 miles a couple of weeks before. Yeah. And I was like, I think I can execute that full on through. If I keep taking in calories, I should be able to do the whole thing. Okay. And so the toe got in the way. But um, it was still, it's it, like before, it was only like I had only been able to run like 18, 20 before I started like yeah. feeling the voice to stop. Yeah. This one was like way, it's like significant increase. But okay. So go, like, from a mindset point of view, I think it's like anything starting really small. Like, uh, I first did a half marathon, and I trained super consistently for it. But I started really small. It was all like two mile runs, three mile runs, and then a long run that started out at like four miles maybe yeah, or five right. miles. Right. 
you know, and, and, and the reality is like that, that may seem like a crazy, it seemed, it seemed like it was crazy to me, but like a five mile run, even if you're super slow, like mm. even if you're longer than a 15 minute pace is like an hour, 20 minutes. You right. know what I mean? It's not like you're going to be out there for six hours, eight hours. Um, and so just starting, basically start where you are type thing. Um, and build on it. I actually really struggled in this marathon prep because I had uh, I did my half Ironman, yep. and then I pulled back a little bit from training, and yep. then I went into full marathon training. Okay. And so now what I'm doing now that that's done is it's like sort of scaling it back and starting at like two, three, four mile runs. I'm gonna do like a 5K or 10K program for the next few months. Okay. Where it's like relatively shorter runs focused on being super consistent, with four runs a week. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I find endurance stuff really fun. Okay. Um, you, you, you put me on the Nick Bear. Nick Bear, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's actually he's he's who inspired because because it was it was a it's been a goal of mine forever. Yeah. Um, and then I, I watched started watching his videos because it's always like you know cardio versus gains, right? Like yeah. the, never the twain shall meet. Yeah. And then you see like this this diesel <laughs> guy, right? Yeah. Like p- pulling seven plates yeah. and 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 doing uh, Ironmans right. and marathons, and that's when it was like okay, I I can do it at a, at a smaller scale, obviously. Yeah, how much of, uh, do you care about aesthetics for yourself, like being a physical specimen? Uh, I do, yeah. I mean, I, but, but also, I'm, like the way that I think is like pretty long-term. Okay. So I'm, I'm cool with, like the thing is, generally speaking, like any weight training will have some benefit. It depends on, like, do I want to be like stage, you know, shredded with, you know, spaghetti <laughs> vascularity, like you can do that, but like there's a whole carb up and, and yeah. you know, there's like, there's like a whole protocol for that, like right. getting super dry and carving up and that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously I care about aesthetic, no doubt. But I think like, I think of, I, I, I care as well, but at the same time it's like, I don't know that do we, like most people are like, we're we're not we're not gonna be on stage, right? <laughs> um, so like our wives are the only people that are gonna see that side of things, right? So it's it's kind of like for, for for me it's it's hard like I care, but then it's hard to get real to care that much when I'm not gonna go to the beach without my sh- like I, like obviously because of our purposes I'm not gonna like be that guy that like walks around I, I don't even wear shorts for the most part, right? I'm not going to walk around with my shirt off anywhere because of that, because, you know, we have to cover our aura and all that. Um, it's more like I care about myself when I look at the mirror. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't think my wife cares. My, 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 my wife, it, it, like, I don't think it would mean a thing to her if I had a freaking eight pack, personally speaking. Interesting. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, like, would, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe because... It's one of those things that she doesn't know. She, maybe it's one of those things that, like, maybe, maybe she doesn't know she needs it. That makes sense. <laughs> but once she gets it, she might be like, "Yeah, I need that now." Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I don't look at it like that. Okay. I look at it like um, I look at a lot of things like this. It's 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 building. Okay. And so it do, like. Do I think aesthetic is important? I think aesthetic is important. Right. Do I think aesthetic in the context of a bodybuilding show and having a balanced chest against like a a wide set of glutes and a B taper that's like super proportioned and that type of thing, like that's not as important to me. But like, yeah, I think I think having like uh, for for example, like the shoulder is really important. Yeah. From a uh, yeah. Like yoked look, right. shoulders, yeah. uh, traps and lats. Right. You know those. Those I think are really important. But it. Yeah, I do. I think I think aesthetic is important, but the the most important thing is function. Yeah. And health. Yeah. But I do think aesthetic. I is I, I think I appreciate aesthetic on the point like it. You should look good in the clothes you wear, right? Yeah. You can't like there, there's these guys that started this whole movement like about um I would say. I um, mean, was it like a, I saw it a year ago on Instagram? Like, um, what's this again? Um, Tanner Guzzi. I don't know if you follow him. He's um, 
I don't have Instagram. Oh, you don't have Instagram. No, yeah. Do Tanner goes, you don't have any social media. Just LinkedIn. And I'm on it at like 15 minutes a day. Like I'm pretty strict with my like you don't have you don't, you don't have LinkedIn on your phone. I, I tried to, cause like Tim Ferriss, like he talks about how he doesn't have any email apps, any social media. Yeah. Um, and I tried that, but I just, I found the trying to schedule interviews pretty hard without a LinkedIn app. Okay. Um, and so that's the only one that I have. That's probably a safe one to keep because it's, you're not going to get sucked into, I mean, LinkedIn can get a little political these days, but in general, you're not going to get sucked in some rabbit hole, I think, on LinkedIn, yeah. right? Because I deleted all my, I don't even have LinkedIn on my phone anymore. Really? I mean, because right now I'm not in the job market. Um, most of the recruiters that reach, reach out to me, I'm kind of like, you guys didn't clearly read my profile at all, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Um, so I just don't, I'm like, I'm good with that on my computer. But um, what the hell was I just saying? Before that, um, before we don't sort of this like LinkedIn tangent, like the whole, yeah, so Tanner Guzzi, they had his whole movement about like wearing, because you know how like guys wear like white t-shirts like t tucked in, the tuck look, and if you, it doesn't look good if you have like freaking, if you have a freaking belly, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I think things like that are like, okay, that's something you, and some of the clothes you, if you're in like Japanese fashion or like selvage denim, it just, or you were in like leather jacket, like I, I'm starting to like, learn more about like leather jackets, right? Maybe, maybe it's a long-term investment purchase I get in. Not, I like All no, Saints? No, like uh, there's, a, there's a company called uh, The Real McCoys. Oh, really? It's, it's Japanese leather maker. So they, I, I saw they have like these, um, they have these motorcycle jackets, right? And it's like 2,000 bucks, dude. Jeez. Right? It's something that, you know, it's something maybe it's, you reward yourself if you ever get like to a director level or whatnot. You know, that, it's not something you would just like, but I think to pull it off, you have to be physically fit. Mm. It just doesn't look good. Like when you see people wearing it, they're not fat. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what I mean. So I think that's a thing. But I, but I, but I, but I, but I do appreciate like the idea of like strike, like having these being inspired. Because when I used to do CrossFit, I thought about it. Looking back, um, I don't know that I got the results from it, but the fact that I tried it and I did it for two to three times a week for a few years. Um, the thing about it was that when I thought the people who were just regular with the gym, they thought CrossFit was hardcore because it, now I don't know if the CrossFit is effective. It's in, you know, there's the whole, I, I don't know that it was for me personally. Um, people, some people, people would get hurt doing it. I never got injured doing it, but I think my inspiration was I saw this chick named uh, Julie Fouché. She was a CrossFit games athlete while being like a medical student. And I think that's what it all ties back to. You see somebody that you're like this person, I like what this person's about and they're just not just a meathead. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like anybody could be like, if your full time job was just like, like I I guess I like the Nick Bear example because Nick Bear, he's into like lifting, running, but he's also running a business, yeah. a company. Now he's a parent too. In a parent, right? And he talks about that versus like compare a guy like you you know like Fuad Abiyat. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Like that's like he's a pure Big bodybuilder. Hoss, right? yeah. that's Here's a pure bodybuilder, right? And and there's things that. I've learned from him, but like, it's harder, it's harder to relate to, right? Yeah. Cause someone who's like, you voided up, bodybuilder, there isn't like, you know, there's not as much to connect with. You know what I mean? So I, so I think, that, I think that's where people should take away is that like, you don't have to do it. I, I, I don't see my, like, I think when you hear about an Iron Man, I'm like, okay, that seems like, that's cool or something. I, I don't know if it, if it entered my, if it enters my mind, like I want to do that at some point, right? I think people need to like take that like to a point of, you know, people shouldn't feel bad, I think, that they don't want to do it. I think <clears throat> like going to the point of aesthetics, yeah. right? Like um, in all areas, you have to just ask yourself what's important to you yep. and not care what other people think. Right. And so like an Iron Man is a proposition. I don't think it's that healthy of an exercise. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yes, it's, it's, it helps you build an aerobic base and is helpful for like mm -hmm. cardio fitness at some level, but just in terms of application, like transferable skills, yep. like you're never going to have to run away from somebody for five hours. You know what I mean? It's not. Was it, it, was it one of those things that it, it, it was a challenge that you just wanted to like a bucket list item? Is that no, that's what, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. The difference between doing one yeah. versus becoming one. Like I want to do races forever. Okay. You know, like uh, I want to constantly be racing. Yeah, I got you. Um, if someone wants to get into running, 
because people have this thing, okay, well, it's bad on your knees and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, how do you get over, like, because one thing, I actually do have thought about getting into running because my cardio sucks. I train jujitsu, right? And I feel like I'm just getting gassed out. And you ask a jujitsu practitioner and they're just like, well, just do more jujitsu. Now, okay, that's one thing. But I'll see my coaches who are competing, who are like, like professional fighters, right? And they're running the stairs at like what Swallow Cliff, you know what mm-hmm. I'm talking about? Is that is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is it called? Uh, in Palos, the, the um, Lake the, Catherine. You know, there's, yeah, like, yeah. there's like there's like outdoor stairs. Yeah, yeah, and I they're know. running stairs and they're doing all that stuff. I'm like, clearly y'all are running, right? You know what I'm saying? So it's not like this whole like, oh, it's just oh, I'm just grappling 24 seven. You guys are running, um, as as a non runner. If you were to prescribe to me, like, how to get into running, like, let's say I just want to run, like, Couple if I want to run a 5K or something, right? Because I think, like, the cardio has to, like, what would, what would, with knowing my routine, would you say get up your steps first, learn to walk first, or would it be okay to, like, do, do, or some people, I feel like they just start running off the bat, cold turkey, and then they pull something or they get shin splints. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think shin splints is kind of like a long thing. So it, your, your nefs can pull you to, to go hard on things that you're not ready for too. Right. right. Like being overzealous in, in, in training mm-hmm. is also ego. Yeah. And so start as small as start as small as is basically not ridiculous. So if you say just putting on your shoes and running on the running till the end of the the block, yeah. like that's crazy low. Yeah. But like maybe running around the block, you know, it doesn't have to like running doesn't have to be measured in miles, especially at first. Mm. And I think most of the time, any habit that's that's starting out, it's just the matter of doing like just putting your shoes on is the most important thing. What What was um, your starting point for running? Uh, my first run was two miles. Like you basically, okay, so you realize I need to get, you. well, I should say my first run this second, cause basically I did the 15 K with Rick. No, I'm talking about gold. Then, oh, with then, so that's 15 K. What year was that? 2014. And then I stopped running for like six years. Okay. And then, so that's what I'm saying. Like my first run more recently after I had lost all my weight yeah. and had some level of fitness was yeah. two miles. So let's go back to when you were with Rick, right? Yeah. Rick got you into the, the the working out at Baxter, yeah, right. Was there any cardio at start? Was that all like bands and like lifting? All lifting, all lifting, all right? Lifting. I and think then, I think if somebody's looking to lose weight, yeah. just lifting is the most important thing. Lifting and sleeping and walking. Lifting, that's sleeping, like walking, and just be, that'll get you down yeah. to like lower because that's what yeah. you you don't see like as like like relentless or like. These guys running marathons. Yeah. They're just on the cardio machine. Car- cardio actually makes it, uh, makes it, in my experience, it's made it harder to lose weight. In really? Ways. Yeah. Because you, you end up getting more conditioned, right? So like, you, for example, like the, the people that are training um, at faster, so like I told you about being like bottom rung in my friend's groups. Right. Um, uh, I'm in this group of, of, of runners and triathletes right. that are like uh, Falastini. Yeah. And I'm like the slowest guy there. Right. But like some of these people, they'll post numbers like just did like a 15 mile run in, you know, an hour, 40 minutes. Okay. You know, eight minute pace or whatever, whatever yeah. that is. Right. Right. And that's their training. So they can go faster in a race. Right. And so as you get more and more conditioned, like you burn less calories when you're doing the activity okay. and it takes you less time. So there's an efficiency element that's really important, but if you're going at it from a fat loss point of view, okay. like cardio is diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps you, your cardio fitness definitely gets better, but so long as you're, like I'm saying, like it's a disclaimer against doing cardio for fat loss mm. because it, you end up kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you become more and more efficient. So, like, so you, like the same five mile run that yeah. you used to do that would burn a thousand calories takes you less time now okay. and you're therefore burning and burns less much calories. Less. Yeah. Right. I got you. So uh, if to like just pure belly fat, for example, lift weights, sleep just, well, walk, that's it. And then I think that's it. And then that's why. It, and so 
a guy like Nick Bear is just running because that's what he likes to do. Yeah. I mean, no doubt. Anybody who runs more than like five miles, it's not like practical application and transferable skills. It's not there. Yeah. It's just... Uh, you're not going to see... Did you, when you're running the Chicago Marathon, did you see like fat people running? Some, yeah. Yeah? And yeah. they completed. Yeah. yeah. Because of they, they just know how to run. They're not lifting weights, but they're just... But they're good at running, and they're maybe their diet's not that great. But their body just isn't gonna like burn they're out. The yeah, interesting. All right, man. Well, appreciate the time today. Uh, we went a little over, but I, I feel it was like, is there anything that we missed that you wanted to cover? I think just maybe the importance of paying attention when you're doing stuff. Okay. Because I think like whether whether it's uh, like for me personally, like having a gym at home, yeah, has been tremendously helpful at being fit. Right. Okay. Because like even if you don't have the time to work out, you can just go down and do a set of pull ups. So yeah. if you can do it, do that. But anything that you're doing, whether it's learning or reading or whatever, just pay, actually paying attention right. and not getting lost into the process of the mundaneness, I think is like the most important. Absolutely. Thing. And if people want to check out your podcast, where can they do so? Common A Podcasts, Spotify or Apple Music. Apple Podcasts. Or podcasts and, uh, and you're on link, you're LinkedIn. I'm on you're LinkedIn. Also, LinkedIn. That's the only social media for yeah. you. All right, for uh, for my listeners out there, if you enjoy the content, you want to see more of it, I need more financial support. So you can be a patron at patreon.com forward slash Sultans and Sneakers. Um, and then make sure if you can't support financially, social media support would be appreciated. Make sure you hit like on the video, uh, subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. I'm also on the, all the audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. What else is Pocket Casts? I have actually never ver- like I was supposed to be on Google Podcasts. You have an Android? No, iPhone. You, you have an iPhone. I should probably verify that I can. I'm actually on Google Podcasts. <laughs> I would say I am, but you and know, I, I feel like nobody listens to podcasts on Stitcher or Pocket Cast. Stitcher. Well, I, I only got Stitcher? a pod- Stitcher. Hey, Stitcher. I'm on Stitcher. Oh really? I, and, I am too, but I've I've never used that or any of the people. I only got a Pocket Cast because somebody told me they listen on Pocket Cast. Same. Casts. Same. And so I, I made sure I got on Pocket Cast. It was it's just an extra thing to do. So yeah, make sure you check it out. Um, for my special guest, Subi Sade, in his beautiful home, gym, which um, you should charge membership for. It's funny, when, when the pandemic started, all my brothers would come here. And I actually had two, um, bo- both yeah, sides right. Right. were, I used to have a leg press and yeah. leg curl and okay. hack squat. Like, oh, really? Yeah, I bought it. All this is buy, buy, buying, selling, buying, selling, buying, selling, and using the cash to upgrade. For, for, for legs now, you're just doing like squats, like barbell squats? You don't, uh, I don't, I don't, no, I don't, because that's too, that's too, uh, like that affects my running. So like sometimes I'll do Bra- uh, Brazilian split squat. Bra- Bra- what is it? Bra- Bulgarian split Bulgarian split squat. I'm like, it's definitely not Brazilian. <laughs> Bulgarian yeah. split squats. I do um, the cable, uh, cable pull throughs, right. Romanian deadlifts. I think I'm going to start barbell deadlifting again because that's my favorite exercise. But it, but it affects your running, you said? Barbell squatting does. Does. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like just high fatigue exercise. That's right. It gives you that dumps. Yeah. <laughs> like two days Kill later, it. you can't walk. Yeah. Right, for sure, man. All right, we well, appreciate it. Uh, listeners, make sure you check out Sufi's podcast. Even, like, I think even if you're not into the bio industry, um, just check out um, – like I'd recommend a Ricto episode for everybody. You know, I think if you got a job, that episode <laughs> will like, you know, help think a little differently. All right. Um, again, appreciate you guys. See you next time. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>